Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. And finally, I am speaking. I say finally because our paths <laughs> have crossed in many kind of not sort of crossed. And then we've, we've talked a lot behind the scenes and oh, can you endorse this book? And, can, you know, me asking him favours and stuff. It's great to actually finally speak to Dr. Richard Carrier. So thank you so much for coming on, Richard. Yeah, it's really awesome to be on. Oh, you, I, I won't waste time with you introducing yourself. Everyone knows who you are. And if they don't, they can go and find out who you are somewhere That's else. Right. Yeah, but yeah. You, 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 you are, I would suggest, a polymath, which is someone who has interests in and expertise in many different fields. And, and we, you know, we can talk about, uh, obviously, history. Uh, it's what you have a PhD in, ancient history more particularly. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and I say intellectual history because it's history of philosophy which gets to another area of expertise. Uh. <laughs> Philosophy, and then theology, and then, you know, you can even talk about, you know, obviously biblical exegesis, and even archaeology, and areas that, that pertain to the, some of those subjects. And so I've got, as, as my viewers will know, I've got multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and that messes with my cognitive abilities. And I used to have a brain that was really good at remembering loads of stuff, and it's really quick, and, and now I, I, I have to... It, completely bury myself in a particular topic and I can do that in a very single-minded one-tracked way but I I'm really hazy on stuff that's out there now and I have to if I'm doing an interview on a certain topic I have to gen up on that that topic and I was wondering with you being a, the, the polymath that you are do you do you have just a wonderful brain that remembers all this stuff or, <laughs> or when you are talking about a certain subject do you have to like re-research it uh, you know, actually, my, my experience is similar to what you're describing, maybe not as severe. Uh, I think I'm just getting old is what, what my, um, <clears throat> no, I, I, I more and more need to be prompted. Like all the information is in there. So like, I'll give you an example, like this is a trivial example, but, uh, it's harder to recall the names of actors and actresses now, but if someone like mentions a movie or, or like, if there's some piece of data that connects in my brain to that and then boom, I got it. Right. <clears throat> so it's all there. Uh, sometimes I need prompting. Um, but the thing is, is my brain is really good at prompting. I, I've like trained myself to like respond to cues. Uh, and I think a lot of that has been a lot of my media stuff uh, and debates and things like that, where I'm just really good at if someone says a thing that triggers all the things in my brain that says, oh, yeah, yeah, I got to remember all this other stuff to get it out. And sometimes it's too much. So if I'm in a live debate, I have to like scribble down some like really shorthand notes. I don't know shorthand specifically, but I do my own. Uh, abbreviations or I have to do some like quick notes so I don't forget the string of things that just came to my mind and then I usually can't even get through them all before the end of the debate and so uh, I do I do have that um, to give me an example I just another example I just recently someone was asking me about my theory regarding the passage of, in Tacitus regarding Jesus and I couldn't remember exactly what I had resolved in one aspect of that theory and so I had to pull out my book and flip through and check it and I was like oh yeah and then once I saw it I was like yeah now I remember all the arguments and and all that stuff. So yeah, sometimes I have like senior moments, but uh, I'm, I've like built my life so that I'm like, know how to deal with that. <laughs> I yeah. Guess. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely a ton of information in there and it's still in there. Uh, and so I, I do like when people talk, my brain is like, it's like a readout is coming out of all the things that I could bring up that are connected to that. And I have to restrain myself. Yes. Because uh, yes. I want to listen to them. Right. So, uh, and not, not. Our, our brains are like f fighting systems, aren't they? Because even when you're just in a normal conversation and someone mentions, I don't yeah. know a thing like Greece and your brain just goes, right. What are all the things I know about Greece and anecdotes about Greece? Or what, what, do you know? Yeah. And that's what happens. And, and then, as yeah, said, it'll be all the things that I much. find the coolest. Right. Like, and then suddenly, Oh, there's this new thing that I just can Anyway. Uh, yeah. So that happens to me, but, but, um, but it is true that I, I've absorbed a ton of information and I take that for granted a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm interacting with people, I forget that like there's so much stuff I've read and there's so many things I know. This has two, two problems. One is um, that this idea about too much information is coming up. But the other is like I have to be careful to make sure that I'm right about things, right? Like rather than get arrogant and assume, oh, because I read a thing that therefore I know this, I know all about this. Uh, so I, I'm actually very self-policing about this to make sure uh, that I, I consult other people uh, who have more expertise than me on certain things, um, rather than just assume that because I read something that it's true, right? There's and a lot so to be that's said a, about epistemic <clears throat> humility, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I found it as an extremely useful tool. I think a lot of people see it as some sort of like straitjacket or some sort of limitation. Uh, to me, it's the other way around. The only way I can like hone my belief system and factual database towards things that are accurate and reliable is by doubting myself 
and like having that, like you said, epistemic humility to, to make sure that you're honing all the time. And you have to do that for years and years to really get to a really well honed database. Uh, and, and that still, you can't like just say, oh, I'm done now. I can just be confident that everything I, I believe is true. No, it's a constant effort, uh, but I've, I've habituated it. It's something that I take, yeah. I take very seriously. It's a fundamental value for me. So before we get on to Easter, uh, I'm interested, are you still, do you still do live debates? Is, is that something that, that you enjoy, that, that you participate in? Uh, I hate debates, um, but I'm good at them. <laughs> right. Uh, so I will do them. I will do them if people meet the, you know, the minimal conditions for a fair debate uh, and pay me. Uh, basically yeah. so i'll do it for a living right uh and, yeah and so yeah like i do like this is the thing we're you're talking about like if a debate is good because it's it's nothing but prompts right because like yeah. all they're doing is make is prompting me like they're giving me a little talk and i can sit there and annotate and i can just and i also know how to diagram the flow of the debate and the arguments i know how to analyze uh, pickups and drops and like do all of that like the professional stuff of debating uh and do it on the fly and so debating is easier for me than some things um it's, but it's uncomfortable because it's stressful in a lot of ways. I mean, one is like there a lot of times my debate opponent's going to get up there and just lie their pants off. And, and sometimes they'll say things that are impossible to check in the live debate. Uh, I had this happen to me with William Lane Craig when I did the debate on the resurrection. I actually debated him twice. People don't often don't remember, but I debated him on national television uh, once on Lee Strobel's TV show. That was back when, when Lee Strobel had a show. Um, and Strobel was a great host, by the way. He was very fair. Uh, but anyway, that was one debate. But I did another really long debate that you can still find on the thing. And it was difficult uh, to keep up with all of his claims because he just shotguns, right? He just throws out a zillion claims. Yeah. And so like, you just don't have time. Like you can just gainsay them. But to actually refute a claim takes more time than it is to make the claim. So that, yeah. that's yeah. why that strategy. Brand Brandolini's, Brandolini's law, which is yeah, which, yeah. yeah. So, so right, exactly. <laughs> so there was a thing. So he went up there and made this whole thing about oh, seventy five percent of scholars uh, agree that the empty tomb uh, was factual. And I get up there and I do a whole bit on how that's false. Like I go through because I know where that stat comes from. It's Habermas. It's easy to refute. It's a bullshit statistic. Uh, and so I go up there and then hey, Craig comes up and says, oh, no, no, I wasn't talking about Craig. I was talking about, and he cites some other scholar. And I'm like, I've yeah, never heard Jakob, of this. Was that Jakob, uh, the German guy? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know who it is, but he, he cites someone and I've never heard of this person. I've not read it. So I'm like, yeah, but he said 75%. I'm sure that's Habermas. I'm sure he's lying, right? Like he comes up there and he claims, oh, I was talking about someone else. And he named someone that I couldn't possibly have researched in time for that live debate. So what can I do, right? Like, so I have to like come up with some way to respond to that live, but I can't outright say, well, I haven't read that. I mean, I can say I haven't read that, but I can't say like, I don't know what he said. So I don't know how to rebut it, right? <clears throat> uh, now later, of course, after the debate, I go check and the freaking, the, the guy that he cited, I can't remember the name, but all he says Jacob is- Jacob Kramer, is it no Kramer? It I'm might sure be, it I, I'm not sure. But all, all the author said was most scholars and he didn't present any evidence or data for this. It was just an opinion. So he just stated an opinion that most scholars think the empty tomb is a fact and it's unsighted, unsourced opinion. Uh, he gives no data. He doesn't say anything about how he derived that. Um, unlike Habermas who does. And so it's actually totally possible to debunk Habermas, but this, this was a useless statement and clearly can't have been what Craig was talking about. Right. So that kind of stuff, I, I get really annoyed by that and it gets very stressful for me in debates because if someone's going to like pull something, pull some shit on me like that, uh, and, and what can you do? And so you have to like figure out, okay, I got to make sure I say everything exactly correctly. If I say one thing slightly wrong and someone's going to nitpick like a, a wrong word that I used at some point. And so that makes debates stressful for me. And, it, but I, you know, I'm good at them. So I'm good at managing these problems. I just, I find them uncomfortable to do them. I prefer like this kind of, uh, interaction where yeah, I don't, I don't care if, if, yeah, if someone picks on me, I got to try off my heater. It's cold up here, so <laughs> the heater running. Well, so funny, it's like really funny you said it. So I wrote a book recently called The Resurrection, A Critical Examination of the Easter Story. Yeah, right? which chapter is six, it, Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thank you for the endorsement. And actually, you feature quite a lot in this book, particularly chapter six, which is called 75% of New Testament Scholars, dot, dot, dot. And in fact, what the story you've just recounted is basically – you know, forms the backbone of this chapter, which is it's either Jack of Kramer 
or it's Habermas, and either way, it's it's BS, and there's an issue. And <laughs> seventy, like seventy, saying seventy five percent of New Testament scholars believe the truth of the empty tomb. It's like well, ninety nine point nine percent of Islamic scholars believe the truth of Quran. Do you believe the truth of Quran? No. Yeah. So therefore, that statistic it's, is thoroughly problematic at the best of times. It's a wor- It's worse than that, right? So like. <laughs> As I pointed out, like people will know that that like he's not even actually measuring scholars, right? So it's not even. First of all, he, he keeps the number keeps going down. Like you mentioned, sixty seven percent. It was seventy five percent. Then it was like seventy percent. Then it was sixty seven percent. And then he'll say like most of those. Uh, in Habermas said this himself. He said most of those conclude this based on the women at the tomb story. That the whole idea that women as witnesses weren't trusted. Uh, and Habermas himself says, well, that's not true. So that's actually like a false inference. So he, he's admitting like most of the people being counted in this statistic have come to that conclusion invalidly. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that's wrong with it. Uh, the fact of the matter is people might not realize this because you hear it a lot. Women's testimony was trusted in a court of law. It was equally weighty to a man's. There were like some minority rulings of conservatives that, that said that uh, a man's testimony weighed more than a woman's. But those didn't prevail, even in Jewish courts, and they certainly didn't prevail in Roman and Greek courts. So it didn't apply to law. And then we have lots of historians who rely on women as witnesses without apology, right? So clearly there's no problem uh, with relying on women as witnesses. So that, that didn't exist. That was a bogus argument. And Habermas knows this, and he, he's admitted this eventually. But the other thing is he's not even counting scholars. He didn't go out and poll scholars. He just went and counted publications, but, you know, if, if, if Christians are just obsessively public, if, if you have like people who are pro-Atlantis, Lost City of Atlantis exists and it's an alien civilization. And those people are going to publish tons and tons of articles pushing their silly theory. You only need to debunk it once. Right. So there's not going to be as many debunkings. But if you went around and said all the people who argue about Atlantis, 75 percent are pro-Atlantis. And I'm like, well, that doesn't tell you anything. Right. You, don't, you didn't poll archaeologists to see how many archaeologists think Atlantis is real uh, or historians or anything like that. So he didn't even do that. Like he didn't even do a real thing. And the other thing is he didn't measure agnostics. So he only counts when his 75% is a ratio of pro-arguers and anti-arguers. Now the law of excluded middle means that there's a whole bunch of people in the middle he's not counting who are agnostics. You say, well, we don't know. So we're not going to argue for or against because we don't know. And you can because actually show you that think there's a lot people. of publications. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of publications probably that are just talking about the empty tomb, but aren't really like going to town on whether it's true or not. Just the, uh, yeah. I, I'm mentioning it. Some people believe it. Some people don't. And you ignoring them. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. And most scholars won't write anything, right? Like if you if you're yeah. agnostic, you have no position, you're not going to write a position paper, right? So uh, so the thing is, he, he's doing a ratio, but he's violating the law of excluded middle. He's not counting all of the agnostics, and so. Uh, so the 75% is clearly a bogus number. It has to has to be, even if his, well, he now says 67%. If it's 67%, it has to be probably half that or less. If you count, if you add in the missing people that you're not counting like the agnostics, there's got to be at least as many agnostics as there are doubters, right? So, uh, and, and anyway, so that, that's the kind of thing that I, I so and I only know this because I've researched it. It took me time. I had to go look everything up. I had to like fact check stuff. It took time. You can't do this in a live debate. So if you were just to be suddenly blindsided with this in a live debate, like that's the kind of thing that I'm always worried about. Are they going to blindside me with some bullshit thing that I can't disprove right now? Uh, and so that's why I find debates and, and only because they're shady. Uh, my favorite debates are the ones where I know the person I'm debating isn't shady. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. I've had some good debates like that, usually with atheists. So like sometimes the best debates I've had with are with people who already agree with me on most things. Um well, yeah. so this comes to, obviously, you're famous for your Jesus mythicism. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the resurrection because it's Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. You know, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jesus has risen or something. So, uh, first of all, I mean, I, mythicism aside, I mean, well, imagine yourself as a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Why is the resurrection so important? And if you were to be able to show, as I hope I do in this, that, that the belief in the historical accounts of the resurrection are in, well are unjustified it is an implausible account of, of 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 the data so if if you were to show that uh belief in the resurrection was untenable what would that do to christian faith can you hold a christian faith without the resurrection um 
Well, you can't, obviously. There are liberal Christians, um, and I've even I even had uh, um, done discussions with them in public. Not all of them are recorded, but uh, there are Christians who think, like, it's all metaphor, et cetera. Um, so they basically reinterpret the religion to mean something else than it originally meant. And then you can go skate along on that. Um, there's also, um, there's different ways to approach this. So there, there, I've always pointed out that it's very clear that Paul thinks, and probably if the way he speaks, it looks like all Christians thought at the time, or at least all who were like the core, the beginning of the religion, thought that Jesus left his body behind. Like the, the corpse was just trashed, right? He just, it was just a, a you know, a capsule that he ejected from. And then he went into a new body, this new supernatural awesome body. And that's the immortal body that he lives forever. And this was a, supposed to be a representation, a symbol for us, right? So, and this is why the resurrection is so important. Paul says this in first Corinthians 15, if Jesus isn't raised, then we're not going to be raised. And if we're not going to be raised, then well, our religion is false. Why do we even believe it? Right. And that's true. Even like you think like the, the core doctrine of Christianity is the atonement, which is the death. Right? Jesus is supposed to have atoned for all our sins by dying. But if that had no causal effect on anything, it has no value. Right? Like, What's the point? If we don't get to live forever uh, because of that, why do it? Like, What's the point? It doesn't do anything. So, so the whole point of Christianity is eternal life. And you only get this eternal life. And the original teaching was eternal life after the resurrection. It wasn't you'd go to heaven and live forever. That's changed. Like popular Christianity now is kind of like, has a wishy-washy idea of the resurrection. It's almost irrelevant. Like we're going to go live in heaven. Why do we need to rise again? Right. Uh, and well, you know, this that's, is a, that's a heresy, so, but yeah, the tension between Christian beliefs that have morphed out of Jewish beliefs and that tension between, you yeah. know, the, the Jewishness of the belief and then, then tension between abstract Christianity of these days with this kind of omni God understanding yes. and the God of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And there yeah. are all these tensions that exist, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's all of those things contradict each other. <laughs> And people often don't know that. Like, uh, I didn't know that like long ago before I went into uh, college to actually study this stuff. Uh, I wasn't aware of some of these things. Like the, the idea that the whole, oh, when we die, we go to heaven. And that's that's Christianity. Like that's a modern, that's a heresy, actually. That's a modern fiction. Uh, the original religion was not that at all. The original religion was much more concrete. It was that you're going to sleep in the grave. But in the end, God's going to rise you up, put you in a new awesome body, He's going to melt everything and then he's going to replace it with better stuff. And then you're going to live in the better stuff uh, is basically. So it was all a very physical, visceral, uh, eternal life. It wasn't a, oh, you just immediately show up in heaven the way we see in movies and stuff. Uh, and then once it's awesome in heaven, why, why do you need anything else? Like you're in heaven and you, everything's great. Like, why do you need a resurrection? It doesn't serve any function. Uh, and that that's really like paganism creeping into Christianity and kind of taking over uh, the dogma. And it, because it's, you know, uh, Christian leaders fought less against that than they fought against other dogma shifts. But they always complain about popular Christians getting things wrong. Like almost no Christian is really a Trinitarian. Uh, if, if you ask any Christian to explain the Trinity, they'll immediately mouth what is officially a heresy, according to yeah. the Catholic Church. <laughs> so, actually, so it's interesting you say that, because what I wanted to do with this book was, was before I, I got into the kind of analysis of what the Gospels say, it's like, let's do a bit of philosophy first and a bit of theology, mm -hmm. because it, it turns out the resurrection can't make any sense anyway. Like, because in order to get to the resurrection being a historical fact, you have to you have to show the coherence of the Holy Trinity. Can't do that. You have to show the coherence of atonement can't do that and like that's those the, without those two like the resurrection is is nothing so yeah yeah it's yeah no really it's right difficult. they do stack on each other um the trinity is less necessary because that's a late development that was not the original thing the original thing is jesus is a subordinate created being he's not but yeah if you I, but, I, you, he, he's but then you're going to jesus like they yeah, share but you go jesus as a messiah though sure. yeah they they share is, like in paul's view they share substance but they are separate entities uh but that's true yeah. of all the archangels all the archangels were pieces of god that were kind of like little little you know amoeba pods of god that go down and do things and they are independent agents as we know from satan who can like break away and rebel uh and jesus undoes satan so if you know the story of jesus is the opposite of the story of of satan uh, people often miss this if you look in philippians 2 it says you know jesus uh, was uh, equal to God, but didn't but didn't decide to claim equality to God. Decided to sub subsume himself, 
and uh, submits, basically humiliate himself and uh, submit to slavery, which means submission to all the natural laws and basically abandoning his supernatural power and then dying. And then for all of this submission, rather than trying to claim equality to God, he is uh, exalted to glory, raised again. And then that undid Satan, which Satan did the opposite. Satan said, well, I'm equal to God. I'm just as powerful as God. And he rebelled rather than submitted. And so, uh, and so basically Jesus' story undoes Satan's story. And it's, it's the opposite. Uh, and this is the theology that they're thinking, right? And all of this is based on the idea that there's actually a Satan, that he actually rebelled, uh, that sin is actually some sort of weird glue substance that exists supernaturally that, uh, that taints you. And it is so powerful. Even God can't do anything about it, except unless he engages in some sort of weird sorcery. Uh, like he's got to do this bizarre blood magic to undo this. Like even God is not omnipotent in this scenario. Um, so it's all of this. This is all God's plan to send an, a little space agent of his to go do this. Uh, and this is true whether Jesus existed or not. The first Christians thought that this is what God did, is that Jesus was sent down from heaven, became incarnate, got killed, specifically to do this blood magic. This is Hebrews 9. People can read that. Uh, to, to undo the things that Satan screwed up about the world. Uh, and this is like this is all weird, wackadoo stuff. But this is what they believed. This was the original religion. It didn't require Trinitarianism. But it did require atonement theory. You had some, it had to require some sort of blood magic had to remove the stain of sin from us so that God could now close the distance between us and him. Cause otherwise he couldn't touch, couldn't have anything to do with people who are tainted with sin. Uh, they had to be down there in the little corrupted world and he can't do anything about it. But if that, that stain is magically removed as some sort of spell cast, well, now we can close the distance. Now he can say, Oh, okay, you're clean. I, I can, I can fix you. And now you can come live with me basically in the end of the world. But, of course, this is philosophically entirely naive because if yeah. God has divine foreknowledge and, uh, you know, uh, omnipotence on <laughs> omnibenevolence and uh, omniscience, then God would know what he's creating before he creates it causally prior to creating it. And would know that it would turn out like X, Y, and Z. Why would he be demanding payment for something that he's <laughs> falsely constructed and designed? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like now with AI, the new AI chatbots are turning out to be a disaster. Like they're, they're, they're allowing people to commit like horrible frauds, like all these horrible outcomes. They're making up sources. There, there was a story recently where someone asked it to like prove some sort of like academic argument and, and asked it to cite sources and it literally fabricated sources so it's smart enough to know what a source looks like but it just made it up it made it made up <laughs> articles that didn't exist um it is but, just know. being like a human then. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay right and yeah. then so now you know now and then of course they're horribly racist etc so now people have to go back and fix it right like after the fact but that just shows that they were like dumb and the, like they didn't they didn't see this yeah. coming and so they had to come fix yeah. it christianity makes god look like one of these dumb programmers that like came up with this idea it went horribly wrong and then it took him like thousands of years to figure out, oh, fuck, how do I fix this? Uh, and he comes up with a completely wackadoo, like duct tape and hairpin solution. <laughs> and, and of course, this is after like the Noah's flood, which is like where yeah. he makes it, it then realizes it's all gone wrong. And just throws everything yeah, off just the modeling it, yeah. table. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Can you turn it off and back on again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Control, alt. Yeah, but there's delete. all those people yeah. in there. You're killing all those people. Wow, turn it off and back it's on right. again. It's fine. I've got eight of them. Eight of <laughs> them are safe. I've kept them. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I no, agree. Like, I agree. That, that makes God look fundamentally really dumb. Uh, and But I think a lot of this is because a lot of this ideology was built before the, the medieval concept of omniscience existed. Yes. And so, yeah. so they're not like, the, like Paul probably didn't imagine God was literally omniscient in the way that it got conceived in the middle ages. That's like this abstract theism that got built out later. Now they're saddled with this idea that God has to be truly omniscient. Now you can argue that there's a reason why they have to be saddled with that. Like the idea of a non-omniscient God is in some ways more problematic. Uh, it's like, what, what, okay, now you're just kind of talking about a space alien uh, you know, like, what, what are we really talking about here? Is this just an AI from Alpha Centauri? I don't know. <clears throat> and then you get to the problem, like, well, if he's not omniscient, he's not infallible, right? Yeah. And, and that gets into all kinds of problems. People need God to be infallible because it's the only way they can trust that he's going to do all the things they want him to do. Yeah. Fix everything. Like, let us live forever, but not in a horrible way. Uh, you know, like, because living forever, there's lots of movies and books about how horrible that can be. But no, no, God's infallible. He won't let any of those horrible things happen. Uh, and so you need God to be infallible. And a lot of this is based on emotional need. And so people need these things to be true. And they 
argue backwards. Like they, okay, how do I find evidence to back what I need to be true? And then of course they only look for the evidence that does that. They ignore all the evidence that contradicts that or explain it away, et cetera. Mm. This is all motivated reasoning. Like people need things yeah. to be true. That's different. That's the opposite of correct epistemology, but you know, you and I both know that. So <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's just interesting how the modern abstracted God of you know the, that's been through that whole process as you say you know the middle ages and renaissance and through through the enlightenment and you've got to this abstract idea of god is just not backwards compatible and and that is that yeah. is the issue because then you go back to genesis and then look at that kind of god and you're like yeah these two things they they you cannot make them coherent there's no way that corporeal being is this kind of god and yeah it just makes no sense no but, i absolutely agree yeah um, talking about Easter, then, uh, so much that we could talk about. What what would be your? And I know you're a, a, a mythicist, so it's kind of putting that to the side and saying, okay, arguing from a historicist point of view. Yeah, which what, I do all the time. Would, yeah, of course. I should say when, when I debate the the resurrection of Jesus, my argument is never Jesus can't have been resurrected because he didn't exist. Uh, no, I say let's let's just grant historicity. There's many plausible historicity models. Uh, plenty of atheists have like complete, they're compatible with atheism. You don't admitting Jesus existed does not threaten atheism in any way. Um, so I can, yeah, I can absolutely argue from that perspective. And whenever I debate the resurrection, I always start from the, the presumption. I just grant for the sake of argument that there was a historical Jesus and that people came to believe this about him. And that yeah. entails certain things, which I think we're going to get into. So, well, yeah. So, what? what well, let's just go broad strokes for for the beginning. Let's. What are? What would you say are the strongest arguments against it? And there are so many. I mean, goodness, I had to really fight to get uh, get my book down to a, like a manageable size. And in fact, uh, Michael Alter's book, which is like a thousand pages, is like the biggest like, analysis of. Uh, is fantastic. But uh, what would you say the, the the strongest arguments against the historicity of the resurrection accounts? Yeah, well, I always break this down very simply. Well, always is the wrong word. Lately, uh, in the last few years, I've realized that it really comes down to this, is that all of the resurrection apologetics depends on a single fallacious argument, which is we are going to assume that when Paul says something, he's talking about the Gospels, right? And once you break that assumption, which is easy to disprove, all resurrection apologetics, apologetics collapses because Paul doesn't talk about the things that are in the Gospels. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Like usually uh, there was just recently someone was arguing, well, uh, you know, obviously it's impossible to have a mass hallucination of a guy who physically shows up and has dinner with you. Like, like everybody at a dinner party can't hallucinate that. It's like, you're right. That would be really weird and unlikely. But Paul doesn't talk about dinner parties, right? Like there's no dinner party in Paul. Uh, there's no physical Jesus showing up at all. Paul says the revelation appeared in him. Like it's, he experienced Jesus mm. inside himself. Like he acknowledges that it's in him, not, not something he saw outside of himself. And even if he did, the book of Acts says it was just a light in the sky. He just saw some bright light and it's like, and heard a voice and just assumed that they were the same thing. And then here's Jesus, et cetera. That's very, very different than the dinner party Jesus from the Gospels. The Gospels work, especially as you go on over time. So you start with Mark, pretty, pretty vague. Tomb is empty. Okay, the body disappeared. Uh, then you have Matthew. Well, now he shows up on a hill, but some of the gospel, some of the disciples are, don't believe it's him. That's in Matthew. People forget that. Like it says that some of them doubted. Some of them weren't sure that it was him. Uh, and then you get to Luke, and now Luke is, oh yeah, he eats fit. He ate with us, and then teleported. And he had let us, he touched let us, touch him and all that stuff. It's like, well, why is Luke inventing all of this stuff when Mark had never heard of this? Matthew had never heard of this. Paul had never heard of this. Paul's talking about what is the nature of the resurrection. Luke's passage would have been fundamentally useful to him about, oh yeah, it's a physical body. You can touch it. And remember when Luke said, you know, like Paul could have totally used this information, but no, the, the idea of Jesus being this physical manifestation that you can touch and that he eats fish with you and all of this stuff. That's that built up later. Let's Luke is the first to actually have a physical touchy Jesus. Uh, and then John goes full on. Like I put my hand in the wound. Like yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, full on. Uh, and he says, and blessed are those who believe without putting their hand in the wound. Like that's so an obvious con. It, it seems uh, <laughs> very much as you, as you would agree. This is, these are very much um, 
in the Gospels, these accounts, the, the corporeal kind of Jesus putting putting fingers in holes and whatnot, it, very much a reaction against the two body hypothesis of yeah. of Paul. So this is there is an agenda going on here, and it's yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's almost an explicit um, ex explicit evidence that these guys disagree with Paul. These aren't just a single harmonious set of accounts. Yeah, and I mean, not that Paul gives an account, but yeah, they yeah. disagree with each other too. That's the other thing. And Matthew hates Mark. Luke wants Matthew and Mark to get along. Uh, John says, "Fuck you all." You know, it's like they're all, they're all, and John hates Luke. Like, so they're, they're like, like they all are arguing against each other. And and you notice this when you start paying attention to like why are they doing certain things why are they inventing certain stories and and the way they are doing um or why but, are they why are they not including like john why do you not include the nativity account that's just been in matthew just been in luke they yeah. are completely different you not can try only, and harmonize them but, right but they're not harmonizable but how about yeah. mentioning them not only does he drop the nativity he drops the baptism uh which is another kind of there's this big argument like well the, the baptism was so embarrassing it's like, well, it's embarrassing to John. That's why he got rid of it. Uh, but it wasn't embarrassing to anybody else. That's why they include it. Uh, and so, um, but yeah, so yeah, he gets rid of the the whole, everything that kind of like makes Jesus human. Even the yeah. crucified Jesus is not crying out in despair. Like, so you start with Mark, he's like in despair, et cetera. Why have you abandoned me, et cetera. And then John's like, no, yes, I am an awesome soldier. I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah, so he's badass Jesus and John, but he, he's he's more of the, the um what they call the the abandoned right so the abandoned righteous man which is a jewish trope so mark is usually actually using jewish heroism like this idea of jewish heroism john hates that he thinks that no 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 jesus was the super mega hero that like you know could kill everybody if he wanted but you know he's he's just stoically going to his death for you know this it's a different kind of jesus he has a different idea well, yeah, because he's got the high Christology version of Jesus, which is Jesus potentially is divine, as in part of Godhead, or there's the germ of that idea. Whereas the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke are very much in the mold of Jesus is a Messiah. And therefore, you know, why am I forsaken? I am different from God. I'm speaking to you, God. And, and we are two distinct entities. <clears throat> Yeah, I have a different take on that. Um, okay. M Mark has Jesus, has the demons recognize Jesus all the time, right? So uh, I think, and Mark is definitely a Pauline gospel. So I think Mark is concealing the pre-existent Jesus super being stuff. Mark's narrative is that Jesus is voluntarily submit, uh, surrendering all of that. He's voluntarily giving up all of that uh, to affect his little scheme. And he's trying to keep the demons quiet. Stop telling people. You know, it's not time yet for people to know that I'm actually the God super being or whatever. Uh, yeah. So I think I don't think they're um, I don't think it's like this adoptionist messianic view versus high messianology later, like high Christology later. Uh, I think what's happening is the secret doctrines which we already see in Paul. Paul's already talking about high Christology. It's fundamental. Uh, what we see in John is it's leaking out into the public documents, uh, into the Gospels. And I think that was always the case in the earlier Gospels. I think they're just concealing it behind allegory. But they did have this different idea where they, the whole idea is that the super being would surrender all of his powers and submit to be killed and so on in order to trick everybody, the demons and so on, into allowing this to happen. And so that he could magically defeat them. Like it's this elaborate blood spell, you know, blood magic spell uh, that he's he's going on. By the time of John, yeah, John's like outright, yeah, he's the super being and therefore he's indefatigable like he's 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 perfect like he he doesn't submit to anything he doesn't you know he, if he submits to anything it's stoically it's not like he doesn't go to the ultimate levels of despair right like the idea when paul's talking about like jesus suffered horribly so that he could understand you and so that you could share like you, you we would be he would share the same fate as you and therefore you could share the same fate as him like that, that's the idea john's kind of like the right? psalms Jesus. almost like the psalmist yeah. might have said no you, literally yeah, yeah. well probably yeah well, get uh, why has that yeah. forsaken me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um I, I i find that the whole resurrection thing to get back to the easter theme mm. uh when you're talking about the what i call sarcissus which is fleshly resurrection that's what luke and john are pushing this idea that the body that died has to be the body that rises and there were these two factions of Christians. There were ones that said it has to be the same body. But then there were the original ones like Paul who were saying like, no, 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 he, he, you discard the fleshly body. That's just a shell. Like that's, 
you just get rid of that. It's like the Heaven's Gate cult. Like you just get rid of your earthly body and you jump into a new one, a better one, and the flying saucer that's coming by and behind, you know, the comet or whatever. Uh, but Paul's saying the same thing, that you jump into a new body and you leave the old one behind. The old one's like trash. You don't need it anymore. You're going to get this new super body. It's an amazing body. It's like indestructible, et cetera. That's Paul. And see, that's what you're talking about, the two-body theory. Like you're going to jump from mm. one body to the other. And this is not unique to Christianity. This, this debate existed in Judaism. And I, I point this out in, um, for people who don't know, this book from, goes way back, uh, The Empty Tomb, which, which you're familiar with. Uh, uh, lots of chapters in that by different authors. They're, they're all pretty good. Such in a good ways. book. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I have to, I've looked back at my chapters in that, and they still hold up, like from 2005. Well, actually, yeah, so I was dipping into that book quite a bit for mine, and, and they do. They, they are. I was like... You know, 2005, that's a long time ago. But yeah, these these are, yeah, they do. Yeah, you're right. you know, they, all the chapters are really, like I have some quibbles mm. with some of the other chapters, but um, but even with the quibbles, they're still pretty good. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, it's a fantastically useful book. I highly recommend people who are into this. Uh, they should get your book. They should get that book. Yeah. And you know, if you really want to deep dive this stuff, the, those, those books cover it all. Um, but in there, like um, the point that I was making was there was this debate even in Judaism, and I show this, between the two body theory and the same body theory. Uh, and they had all these arguments between them, of what they are. And they were Pharisees, by the way. So two different factions of Pharisees are arguing uh, over, is it a new body or is it the same body? No, it has to be the same body for this reason. No, it has to be a different body for this reason. Paul, of course, is a two body theorist. Luke and John are a one body theorist. <clears throat> but it's this idea that you have to rise in the body uh, that, you were, uh, that you were died in. That's why that Jesus has to show his wounds, right? Is to prove. Uh, and this actually tracks there's Jew, the Jewish argument. So you can see like the Jews were arguing this, like the ones who are one body theorists said, no, you got to show your wounds. Like that's actually literally in the argument. So when you see John doing it, you know, in the context, he's arguing, he knows this context. This is the context of the Jews arguing with each other over the nature of resurrection. So he's picking a side in that debate and then inventing a story that backs his version the side he picked and the right. empty tomb itself of course so you know, this is why yeah i think in mark it's a, have the empty tomb right i think in mark, mark it's a it's symbolism like an allegory but by the time of john absolutely it is you no know, the empty tomb is proof like he's using it as proof that jesus rose yeah. from the dead that's why he has yeah. what i think is lazarus go into the tomb and find the cloths there and the whole thing like I, so um yeah no totally uh but the most i don't remember if you cite caroline bynum in your book um but no, I, I often recommend it caroline bynum did a book um on resurrection apologetics in the first three centuries uh, she does like the up to 200 uh how the resurrection was argued uh, and i can't remember the name of the book but you look up caroline bynum that's b-y-n-u-m uh and she she basically analyzes the rhetoric right and so this this kind of stuff we're talking about right now what, what stories did people invent to sell what ideas so who's arguing with who here what, what are the arguments going on we've forgotten these things now christians who read the gospels are reading them in their own context they don't realize that the gospels were written in a context two thousand years ago where there are these arguments going on like they're, they're in argument with these things going on in their day uh and so you can misunderstand what's actually going on in these gospels if you don't know the context and she points mm. out, this is my favorite, and I talk about this in Not the Impossible Faith for, in the book that I have. Which that. is a great book. Yeah, I, I still like it. I still like it. It's a fun book, uh, Not the Impossible Faith. It's just so good on taking to task people's views on Luke. And Luke is this great historian. Well, is yeah. he? Let's have a look at that. Because <laughs> no, well, I'm not sure he is. And yeah. here's for why. Just, right. Yeah, and and we're not alone in this. That's the other thing is I cite scholars and they're pointing this mm. out like this. We're not the only ones who pointed this out. But yeah, uh, no, Luke is not a great scholar. Acts is not a reliable history. Um, I'm working on a blog on this point, actually, as I speak. Uh, but she points out that when she you can look at the rhetoric of Tertullian. Right. And so, you know, Luke, Luke was written. Luke and John were written like not long before Tertullian's writing, like maybe a generation before. And uh, Tertullian's very much, he's very upset with these Montanists, these, this, this heresy, who are uh, elevating women to positions of authority. Uh, he doesn't like that. Uh, he doesn't like the fact that the women are claiming, they, they, he says something to the effect of, well, Paul said we're all equal, like in Christ, we're all the same. And in the resurrection, we're all going to have the same body. So distinctions between men and women won't exist. And so there's no reason to have distinctions between men and women now. 
uh, and therefore, you know, equality, right, is what's going on. So there were there are actual factions of Christianity arguing this. Tertullian is not having it. He's like, no, 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 no. There has to be gender hierarchy. Men are superior to women. Biology establishes this. God made their bodies in this particular way to establish this superiority. Therefore, we have to rise from the dead in the bodies that died so that we preserve our physical features that preserve gender hierarchy. So in order to have the gender hierarchy, you have to have the bodies. And to have the bodies, it has to be a single body resurrection, you, the same body that died. And if that's the case, then Jesus had to have risen in the same body that died. Therefore, he has to have shown his wounds, etc. Like, this is the backwards reasoning that we were talking about. This is also to say, so, like, if, if, damn it, if I'm going to have privilege in this life here, then when I die, I'm going to yes. have that privilege in my <laughs> next life as well. Yeah, no, that's literally the reasoning. And so when you see, like, Luke and John having the physical body of Jesus, they're, they're inventing stories. Because, you know, because Matthew and Mark don't have these stories. So these stories came up later. They're inventing them. They're inventing them to the purpose. Like this is the story we need to tell to sell this particular idea. But when you look in the context, oh, it's this debate between these egalitarians and these patriarchalists in the church is going on in the background, but you don't see that explicitly in the gospels. They're not going to say this. They're not going to admit it. Uh, and so, so if you're just reading the gospels, oh yeah, this is an eyewitness story. This is what happened. And like, you're totally missing it. Like this was a whole propaganda war. There's a whole bunch of subtext here that you really need to understand is who's arguing with who and why, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's the thing that people miss when they're like dealing with the Easter stories. You got to go back to the original context. It's shadier, it's slimier, there's, uh, it, it's messier, it's not as neat and glorious as the, the New Testament paints it, basically. Yeah. Um, and so so when I ask you what's your main argument or, or what are your strongest arguments against the, the, the resurrection's historicity, that you would disconnect. say well, the disconnect between Paul and the Gospels. Yeah. And in fact, everything just looks like it's just invented there. Right. On it. And, I, and I, I love the idea about. Um, yeah. If you get how... rid of the Gospels, pretend they don't exist and just read Paul. Um, then there's nothing weird. Like everything's, oh yeah, like uh, mystical experiences that you have in your in yourself that convince you of things. Everybody has that. Like there's nothing special about it. Uh, and it's very clear, like even in 1 Corinthians 15, this is a passage that'll often get cited as evidence for this. Like, oh, the 500 people saw Jesus. But it's important to look. Like he says, every, you know, various people see Jesus, but only one time was he seen all at once by everybody at once. Only one time he goes out of this. It's the 500 brethren or the, the more than 500 brethren who all at once saw Jesus, he says. But everybody else sees them. It's clear that the implication, conversely, is that everyone else had private experiences of Jesus, just like mm. Paul. Just like Paul. So there's only one public experience. It's this to all the brethren, he says. Uh, and now the question is, well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean dinner Jesus. Jesus is showing up and having dinner with 500 people. It's probably something like Acts 2. Uh, where they, they just had this like experience of they, they hallucinate amorphous lights in the sky, feel the presence of Jesus and just conclude, oh, we're seeing Jesus now, right? Like, it's not like they see like a phys the exact physical form and they're conferring mm -hmm. with each other. Wait, does he wearing blue? Is he wearing, or is he wearing the same thing? Are we seeing this? No, they're not doing that. They, they just see like a, a sort of vague light. They feel the presence of Jesus and they say, oh, we're seeing Jesus. They're not conferring as to whether they're seeing exactly the same thing uh it's just an ecstatic state and this is where, this where you've done yeah you've done work on this in terms of a lexical analysis of uh of what paul says in terms of yeah. the 500 and is it actually referring to pentecost and pentecostes and so on and so forth so yeah yeah people that's another thing is i so this is the thing i can't prove this is, I, I find this like i can't prove it like conclusively to convince no. a skeptic right and so uh, but it's so obvious. It seems obvious to me that this is what has happened, but I can't, it's the evidence is not strong enough to prove it. So I will argue the way I just did, where I say like the best evidence is to just separate the gospel from Paul and see that they're talking, they're making the gospels are clearly making stuff up. What Paul talks about is, is all cross religions in the world throughout history. There's nothing weird or unique in Paul's account of things. And so you can explain the origin of, of religion of Christianity that way. Um, the next argument I would make, by the way, if you would say what my number two, which is the one I point out at the end of my chapter in the Christian delusion on the resurrection of Jesus, which is that Jesus only appeared to one opponent, maybe two. 
whereas like a real risen Jesus would appear to everybody like in China, Mesoamerica, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, you, if, if we had records from all over the world that were simultaneously produced of a Jesus appearing to everybody, that would be good evidence that something weird happened, uh, right? I might not prove every specific Christian dogma, but it would prove that there's something going on there that we can't dismiss as just parochial uh, hallucination or dreams. But that would be my second thing. Um, but the first thing is this disconnect between uh, Paul and the Gospels. And when you look at Paul, it looks like regular stuff. There's nothing really weird there. But yeah, when you get into like lesser arguments, arguments that are weaker in the sense that they're not going to be convincing to skeptics. Although once you agree that it's bogus, then it becomes more convincing because you realize your opposition to it, your emotional opposition to it is gone. And that's this idea that I think uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 or 6 can't remember i think it's six five or six uh is it's six uh verse six where it says um jesus appeared uh to more than 500 brethren at the same time <clears throat> i think that originally said appeared to all the brethren at pentecost and the reason mm -hmm. i say that is because the 500 and pentecost are nearly identical words in greek um like the, the a simple scribal error can convert one to the other uh, and there are other similar, the words in that passage are similar to words in Acts 2, um, Acts 2, 1 to 3. There's a description of the public ecstasy, the first public moment of Christians where they had this public ecstasy where they all came together and started speaking in tongues and people were there to see this and say, oh, they're speaking in tongues, etc. But it talks about them all at once being together uh, and having this experience. And I think Acts, when Acts was written, when Luke wrote Acts, I think the first Corinthians passage read uh, all the brethren at Pentecost. And I think that's the passage that Acts 2 is building on. They're taking that and building out a story. Like we've got this little passage in Paul. We're going to invent a story based on that. And they're drawing on, okay, it's at Pentecost because Paul said uh, it's all the brethren. So we're going to invent a number. They invent the number is 120 brethren. Clearly they didn't read Paul. There was no, they didn't, they didn't read our Paul. They didn't see 500. They, they just invented 120 because they took 12 tribes of Israel times 10. And they just made up a number, 120. But they didn't, the 500 number didn't exist yet. Uh, they, they only know about Pentecost. And so I think that's why Paul wrote Pentecost, not 500. Uh, and so I think that's Acts is just inventing a fiction out of Paul's passage. And the same the way it does with the tongues so in acts to the tongues everybody's speaking an actual language so other people walking by oh he's speaking persian he's speaking uh you know like everybody i recognize my language that's not like we tell from uh first corinthians 14 that that's not how tongues worked uh tongues worked as just random babbling and you had to have like a interpreter because it was supposed to be some sort of weird angelic language and you had to be inspired by the holy spirit to interpret it and translate it uh, that's the actual speaking in tongues, which we know from multiple religions across world history is a common phenomenon. Uh, and so, uh, glossolalia. yeah, yeah, so right. So glossolalia. So acts just fictionalizes this into, Oh, they're actually speaking languages, real human languages to reverse the fall of Babylon, the tower of Babylon. Right. So acts is fictionalizing that I think acts is fictionalizing the appearance to all the brethren in much the same way. And anyway, that's, I think that's very clear, but you, you have to, I can't prove it like as conclusively as I can prove other things. So that, that's more of an argument for people who've already agreed it's all bullshit. Uh, and once yeah. you're, once you freed yourself from that, now you can start seeing these patterns and say, you know what? That's actually a plausible sequence of events uh, in terms of the transmission history of the text. One of my favorite um, aspects of the whole resurrection account is, is something I heard you talk about ten, in that D William Lane Craig debate that you had. I'm sure you brought up the whole Yom Kippur thing there. I remember reading about Yeah, I did. Yeah. You, 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 you <laughs> he tried to argue that. against it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so this is when I was just getting into this stuff, you know, a decade or so ago. And then here I am now writing a book where that's a, a I find one of the most interesting components of this, of this whole thing. Uh, so, I, can you remember enough to tell the tell the viewers a what is Yom Kippur and b what is going on with the account of Pilate letting one of the the one of the um, you know criminals go and whether there's precedent for that uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, I often forget this. this. This actually is a part of the Easter story. You're right. Um, 
And one of the arguments that William Lane Craig gave against this idea, uh, which is the idea that um, Mark chapter 15 is essentially recreating the Yom Kippur ceremony with a fictional story about Jesus and Barabbas, uh, people who know like there's this this rebel called named Barabbas, etc. And people, oh, it's just this guy named Barabbas. Actually, Barabbas is Aramaic for son of the father, which is a really convenient name uh, in this Jesus, case. Jesus, son, right. son of the father. <laughs> and there are manuscripts okay. of Matthew where G it is Jesus Barabbas. So the right. word Jesus, he is actually multiple times. So it's not like some accidental transposition. Like it was, I think, original manuscripts of Matthew uh read jesus brabus i suspect mark originally read jesus brabus i think that's where because it's unlikely that matthew would figure this out and add the name jesus i think he's copying jesus brabus right out of mark but our all our manuscripts of mark which are fairly late we have a few like early ones but they're like tiny pieces and they're not this piece um so i think mark originally read jesus brabus that's why some manuscripts of matthew read jesus brabus the scholar Origen says that there were Christians in his day that were embarrassed by the fact that Barabbas was also named Jesus and were subtracting the name from the manuscripts. So even Origen himself like gives us a reason why it got deleted. Uh, but the, it makes it even better. So if it's Jesus Barabbas, you yeah. have Jesus, son of the father, and then you have our Jesus, who's Jesus, son of the real father. So you have two Jesus, sons of the father. You have two identical people. And this is Yom Kippur. Uh, where you have you take it's very specific in Leviticus 16. You take two goats; they have to be identical, like you can't tell them apart. Uh, you cast lots; you pick one at random. One of them, uh, you the priest lays hands on the goat and like basically magically casts all the sins of all the Israelites onto the goat, and that becomes the evil goat. And then you drive that goat away, and like you, you cast it out into the wilderness. Um, Leviticus doesn't mention it, but we have in other texts, Jewish texts, that. The mob then like drives the goat, like they chase it and scare it off a cliff, and then it dies. There's, so that, that's and there's almost like mocking involved as well. There yeah, are there's even, right. There's, there are yeah, even there's ideas that it, there's yeah. a there's a crown of thorns or some a band yes. of thorns possibly uh, put on the, the goat, ribbon, and also scarlet right, ribbon. Right, right. There's which a lot Matthew, of details. So when when Jesus has a, 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 a I think a purple robe in the early gospels, mm -hmm. and then in, crown of thorns, and then he's beaten. The scarlet. Uh, Matthew yeah, has it a, turned into a scarlet right. robe, and you yeah, like yeah. so. So the idea is that the pilot has these two identical humans, uh, yeah. and lets one go into the wilderness, and the other one is executed. Just but as treats, the high priest lets one go, go, go. But treats and the, other the one, one is executed, treats the one that sacrificed. is sacrificed as the scapegoat, right? So the message is that they they've got it wrong, right? Like the the Jews are picking the wrong Messiah. Uh, Pilate has figured out he's, he's got the wrong, he's treating the, the atonement goat like the scapegoat. He's, he doesn't realize, he doesn't know that the real scapegoat is Barabbas and the atonement goat is Jesus, right? It's all about, they don't know, like they're doing it wrong. And so that's the whole message. Uh, and then of course, with the Leviticus ceremony, the one that's cast away, uh, the other one, the identical goat is then slaughtered and its blood falls on the altar. And, and that, uh, that atones. So that is the atoning goat. That is the innocent goat who's killed as if it, you know, in place of the scapegoat to atone for all the sins, right? So that this makes no sense from an abstract theistic perspective as to why God needs to do any of this. Uh, but it made sense in their day because that was the Yom Kippur. That was how you cleansed Israel every year. You did this goat ceremony. One goat represented Israel. The other goat carried the sins of Israel. Uh, the mob would kill the one goat and then the priest would sacrifice the other goat and its blood would atone. And so Mark is clearly having Jesus as this Yom Kippur goat. He is the atonement goat. Uh, that is the whole message of it. And then Barabbas, of course, he's described as a murderer and a rebel. So uh, these are the two fundamental sins, like all sins stem from rebellion and murder. Uh, this is, you know, even, uh, you know, there are modern missionaries that use this argument, but it was true then. Like, this is like the two fundamental sins. Like, all of the sins are just versions of this, right, of murder and rebellion. Uh, and so uh, Barabbas represents the sins of Israel. He's a murderer and a, re and a rebel. Jesus submits. He's passive. He's not violent. He, he gives in and submits and sacrifices himself for the common good. So he's the good person. Barabbas is the evil person. And so then it's, it's also the militant Messiah. So Barabbas represents militant messianism. Jesus represents pacifist messianism. So this is a critique 
of Jewish, mess two different camps of Jewish messianism, right? It's the ones who go to war and the ones who submit, right? Like those, these are the two things. So there's a lot of really brilliant artistic uh, symbolism going on in, in Mark, but this it is, is all That's fiction. such a good point though. Um, so sorry to interrupt, but the, yeah, is, the idea, is, is the idea that like when you understand what the gospel authors are actually doing here, like yeah. when you understand their agenda and it's like, we are writing this theology that we have created and, uh, or understand or, or want to imbue in Jesus or whatever, we are then going to create a story that represents all of these ideas. We are, we are historicizing our scripture, if you like, yeah. uh, or, or our, th our theology. Then it's brilliant. I mean, what what these authors actually do, like I, none of it's happened, right? It's it's a histor yeah. historical, but but it's really clever. And like, and yeah, yeah. when when you understand that, I think it be it, it becomes even even greater. Do you know what I mean? R Absolutely. Than, uh, I had this reaction to Gospel of Mark. I had been told through all my education that Mark is a hick. It's lowbrow. It's uh, he's clearly not brilliant. Uh, you know, it's just a simple storytelling. But when I actually like read up on the literature and read up on what's Mark is doing, no, Mark is a genius. Like he is, he is like Mark Twain. Like he's writing in a popular dialect, but he himself is not some yokel, right? Like he he knows what he's doing. He's doing this on purpose, and he's it's a very brilliant crafting of this fiction. Like the symbolic of, symbolic fiction is brilliant, and I think that's. Uh, that's missed. People who treat the Gospels as literal, as infallible, the way that like evangelical Christians do, they're they're ruining it. Like they're 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 missing everything. They're destroying everything. Like they're they're not getting the genius of these books. Now, the books are genius from within their point of view. I think mm. they're written from the point of view of people who are like had very primitive and completely inaccurate views of the world and the cosmos and how everything worked. They're wrong about everything. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is terrible. It's not beautiful. <laughs> it's some of the worst ethical philosophy ever written. Um, but from their point of view, the way they construct it is brilliant, right? So uh, these are very creative and genius fiction writers. And I think you, you, you don't appreciate that and don't understand it and don't get uh, you don't really get what they were trying to do if you approach it as if these are literal, just simple histories. And because and that, that's not what they're even doing. Um, but you can get more out of it once you see that. And I got to that point where now I'm I'm a really big admirer of Mark as an author. Like as an author, he's really brilliant. He's he's Shakespearean, really, uh, in in the constructions that he he develops. But this results in the conclusion that he's not writing history. Like like you yeah, said, none of exactly. none of this stuff happened. Yeah. So and this is what I find. And thank you so much, uh, Lisa Renaissance. Really appreciate that. Um, thank you uh, I, so this gets to the idea of like a scripture history historicized which is the idea that they've got an agenda they've got a yeah. theology right let's let's create stories to reflect this so uh, you know that that to me cast aspersions on the historicity of those yeah. stories they're just made up to fit that agenda but then the christian could argue back that no 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 th this is this is history scripturalized where this actually happened and there's several ways of seeing that but one way might be that you know god has created the world in such a way that pilot really did uh, let one guy go and and they were both called <laughs> jesus Barabbas type thing and then and then the other yeah. one was crucified and it's just to show the symbolic like r brilliance and this what well, the symbolism of this event yeah like so, god is this genius time traveler who like sets everything in motion so that okay the one guy that's going to be let go is going to be named this we're going to make sure that yeah like yeah you could totally picture that i mean that would be like in itself brilliant fiction uh but it is not what the gospel authors are implying that's not what they're doing but and obviously it didn't happen like the probability of all of this happening uh is near zero even if you presume a god exists it's much less probable uh well actually you, the, point, the god exists point but. but the point you're saying is, is really is salient which is that god would have to actually might uh, it's a it's a point i made in one of my first books actually that if right. you believe in prophet prophecies you have to micromanage like if you're saying this this claim in 600 bce predicts something that happened 600 <laughs> years later then in order for that to actually happen you have to micromanage the entire universe such that that actually does happen and therefore you're kind of negating the idea of free will and all these it's, it's the point is it's just 
yeah. it gets it, it gets you into more problems than you think it solves. <laughs> like prophecies, the scale of manipulation. Yeah, the scale of manipulation, is, and which you have to like. First of all, that's offensive in and of itself that God is manipulating events and people that much. But yeah, that he's only doing it for this trivial fucking reason yeah. and not to do something actually productive. Just so like you go, that. oh, wow, yeah, that, that, <laughs> I can see the connection. But, you're, but like, you like, you're in the crowd, okay. like watching if, Jesus, Jesus get, yeah, you, I get it. I get why you've done that, pilot. Right. If you can manipulate history that brilliantly over centuries, why couldn't you manipulate history to prevent the Holocaust or something useful? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it becomes offensive when you realize, wait a minute, if we're going to grant that God's doing this, Whoa, hold on. There's all kinds of other things he could have been doing instead. So, and it I, I, very didn't, I didn't mention that slavery was explicitly bad. I didn't say that. But what yeah. I did do is just get a couple of uh, criminals <laughs> to look like a couple of goats. Yeah. But, but okay, Ebola, yeah, as for Ebola, I mean, I, Ebola's not very important. Right. And, you know, uh, no, I pandemics. like you mentioned the slavery point, though. Um, that's Matt Dillahunty's point, And I agree with him, which is everybody will ask you. just mentioned. By the uh, yellow stoic. Okay, here. yeah. Would you go uh, they'll on mention, Matt Dillahunty's The Hang-Up? I don't, I don't know what They'll ask him, is. like, what would you change? What, what's one thing God could have changed? He says, well, just outlaw slavery. Like, yeah. Fundamentally. Like, that should be in the Old Testament. Like, right there. Like, it should be, nope, no slaves. And here's why. So, like, even, like, explain why. Like, no slaves, and here's why. That would be wrote, amazing, right? But no. I wrote an article there. on that. I wrote an article on slavery. on uh, it basically right. based on Hector Avalos's book uh, on yeah. biblical scholarship and slavery, which is a fantastic book. It really uh, is, yeah. It, it's, it really is very good. And and the beginning of my article is is on Only Sky was basically um, the Bible fails on slavery, and it fails so fundamentally on slavery. I mean, it really fails on slavery yeah. that I dismiss the Bible on that alone. Like, I'm not interested. Like. I do do biblical exegesis because I like it and I get a kick out of it. But essentially, I don't need to <laughs> because the book has failed yeah. because it couldn't outlaw slavery. Like Moses didn't come down from the from you know horror Mount Sinai and say, "Hey, I've got these these stones from from God." And it said, "Look, it's got a bunch of stuff written on." Number one in capitals is "Don't do slavery, you Egypt." And number two <laughs> is "Refer to number one because it's really really important." Don't do slavery. Honestly, just don't do it. Like it that yeah. never happens. No, so it's, it's especially about what, the, what the Bible doesn't say is uh, yeah. as much as what it does say. Sorry, it's especially astonishing because the whole Exodus story is we were slaves, right? Like so, like, like they don't even have their own self learning. <laughs> like, they don't even realize, oh, slavery is a bad idea. Like they didn't even learn, which I think in a way is one of many arguments. It's not one that's been used, but I think it's one you could add that the Exodus story is bogus because if if any of that actually happened, one of the first things they'd say is, oh, now we realize slavery is a bad idea because we were slaves and we should not have slaves. But no, they didn't learn that lesson because that never happened, right? They were never slaves. That they, so they, right, like these are, Exodus was written by slave owners. It was not written by slaves. Uh, and so that that's that's one of the well, yes, because they come out, they've come come out of Egypt and they go, oh, we're out of bondage. Oh, slavery's yeah. terrible. And then yeah. they go and enslave the Canaanites. <laughs> right, right. Right. So uh, what's so, your guys? Uh, any self consciousness? Yeah, yeah. With no self consciousness, no like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do to these people that, that what other people did to us. Golden rule, fuck that. Right? No. Yeah. No, no. There's yeah. no self consciousness because the book is entirely written by slave owners. It's n it was never written by people who had experienced slavery. And so, uh, yeah, I think th there are better arguments for why the Exodus is bogus than that, but that's just, I well, think I'm actually halfway, I'm halfway through a book, uh, the third, the trilogy, the third of my trilogy of critical examination. So nativity, resurrection, and I'm doing one on the Exodus, uh, which is uh, oh, wow. the Exodus yeah. critical examination of the Moses story. Now, w this leads on to a question to you. I asked you whether you could have Christianity without the resurrection theology or events can you have christianity without the the exodus or even like more in a more grandiose fashion without the old testament i mean not not originally right like the whole original concept of christianity that launched it is fundamentally dependent on the old testament and this is clear in the gospels even jesus is made to quote the old testament as historical fact right like he, you have mm -hmm. to if that if the Old Testament isn't true, it's really hard to justify anything that goes on in the New Testament, basically. It, it can be done, and that's where you get liberal theology, this idea it's all metaphor, etc. 
Uh, so you can do it, but you have to really fundamentally transform the religion. It, it's not what it was originally being packaged at, packaged as or sold as. Uh, so when you look at the New Testament, that particular version of the religion could not countenance the, the falsity of the Old Testament. Uh, it could countenance like reinterpreting the Old Testament in cosmic terms. Uh, like there's a debate, like you can tell that there were ancient scriptures uh, that were scriptures at the time. Uh, that put the Garden of Eden in heaven, like it's in the third heaven. And then when e Adam and Eve are kicked out of Eden, they're literally fall. The fall is literal to earth. And so there's like a, a, a dim copy of Eden on earth that they fall to and that's et cetera. Uh, and so there were, there were Jews who believed Eden was an actual place on earth that you could go find somewhere in the East. And then there were others who said, no, no, you can't, you have to go up into outer space. It's in the third heaven. As so you had these different competing views, uh, both views are uh, cockamamie, but uh, you had these debates like this, this actually happened back then. But that's the context of the original Christianity. Modern Christianity has evolved so much that, yeah, you could completely transform the religion to be this sort of abstract, liberal, progressive concept, you know, process theology and all of that. Like you can do that. Um, it's just not satisfying to the ones who were gravitate towards evangelical Christianity or conservative Catholic Christianity and so on. Because uh, they, in order for those structures, those institutions and their dogmas to exist and be true, you need the whole architecture on which they're built. And that architecture yeah. has been literalist. It's been uh, that sort of fundamentalist structure, even Catholicism. And so, that, yeah. That leads me to believe that, because I've often said that liberal Christianity is actually more difficult to hold to than conservative Christianity. Because there's, it seems to me that, that if I was going to be a Christian, well, I'd be a liberal Christian just for moral reasons, but like for a kind of like ease of belief, it's like, right, I'm just going to wholesale just be a presuppositionist, whereas I presuppose the truth of the Bible. <laughs> and that's it. You know, the, the Westboro Baptist <laughs> church members, like, uh, right, we're really literalists. Don't care what you guys say. This is how it is. Where and, and that's easy. And I, I can I can do that. Whereas a liberal Christian has to go, well, okay, it says that there and that there. How, I've got to do it. And they're consistently mentally contorting and jumping through hoops in order to get to something that looks like a, a kind of moral, decent worldview to to maintain. And I just, I, I can understand why, you know, it's just really difficult to be a liberal Christian, I guess. Yeah. Hector Avalos would agree. And uh, we mentioned him before. He did the book, The End yeah. of Biblical Studies, which is one of my yes. favorite good, good, good uh, book. ones. All his books are great, by the way. Go, go look at yeah. it. Search on Amazon for Hector Avalos. He's, uh, every one of those books, like what the title says is what he does in that book. And it's amazing. But uh, in, in The End of Christianity, he's it, it's an extended argument for him losing his job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the biblical Which, uh, studies. Yeah, he's yeah, so like, I shouldn't even be employed. Like, this shouldn't even be a thing. And here's why. And he goes through this whole long thing. But he has a whole section, and this is an important point. Like, because a lot of people think Christianity, they assume conservative Christianity. They forget about the liberal stuff. They set it aside. Uh, Avalos has a whole section on liberal Christians and why that's also bogus. And uh, and he goes into this this point, like you're talking about, like how the contortions you have to go through to maintain liberal Christianity are much greater than conservative. Like it's in a sense, like conservative Christianity has fewer contortions with the scriptures. Uh, they have, they have to contort. There's some contortion that is required, but their contortions are mostly with reality uh, rather than the scriptures. Whereas liberals, like they have to do more contortions with scripture than with reality. So they're, they're trying to make their religion more compatible with reality and the facts and so on. And so they have to distort scripture way more than the literalists do. Uh, the literalists still have to distort Christ uh, the scripture to get it all to work. But to do that, they have to massively distort their beliefs about reality, like how the world works, how human psychology works, how history went, uh, how physics works, like everything. They have to like massively divorce themselves with, from reality to get the scriptures to work. Uh, but, but Avalos points out that both projects are like hopeless in the sense that they require too yeah. many contortions. It's yeah. just a question of where you're contorting. Where, but yeah. where if you can move the contortions around, it's still a ton of contortions. Uh, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, for the, for the evangelical kind of literalist, it's just a case of it, as long as you accept that you're going to bury your head in the sand and like, just say it's all true, like that's the kind of easy, then it's all easy. But it's just like, am I the sort of person that would ever do that? No. <laughs> uh, Moon Pearl, thank you very much. Uh, and before we get on to sort of talking about your your courses and um, or your course that yeah. you're, you're doing at the moment. Let's um, do some questions, Moonpearl, yeah. 
Yeah, Moon Pearl has a question uh, from Lisa. My question is, Dr. Carrier, do you think the Jesus character was based on one of Herod's sons whom he garroted? No, um, I haven't heard this one. So I don't know where, who's, who's advancing this idea. Uh, no, I don't think that's, there's any basis there. I, I would say it depends on what you mean by the Jesus character. So there's Jesus of Paul. And then decades later, you get the gospels. And the Jesus of the Gospels is built out of many other things. So the Jesus of the Gospels is built out of Moses, Elijah, uh, another Jesus character that has nothing to do with Christianity, Jesus Ben Ananias, um, uh, probably some pagan models. So Odysseus uh, and Romulus. Like, so they get all these ideas from other religions and other politics and then build a story invented out of Jesus, invented into Jesus. And so the Gospels is one thing. The character in Paul is different. So that's a question of, uh, I personally think that that's based more on Jewish angelology than on any kind of historical events. So I think Paul is, and they're first Christians. Paul is not the first Christian. I think people forget that, that he's, he's a latecomer, uh, came in a few years after the religion started. Um, but I think the original Christians and Paul who joins in later I think are building their Jesus out of a kind of uh, super angel that they think they find in scripture. So they're kind of like sort of invented this figure as my personal view of that. Now, I don't think it's based on any actual historical figure. Uh, when the gospels are written, they do pull from some historical figures or figures they believe to be historical. Uh, and, but it's not, there's no connection to the Herods uh, in my view. That, that leads me on to a question I was going to ask you anyway, which is what do you think as a, as a mythicist, what do you think of one of the theories that Jesus is a composite of his other historical kind of itinerant preachers or leaders or, or rebels yeah. or whatever? Yeah, I, I think that's plausible for the Gospels, right? When, when the Gospels are, they decide they're going to write a historical story, they're going to invent a biography about this figure, uh, where are they going to pull their material from? Uh, right. And it's obvious they're pulling it from everywhere, right? Moses, Elijah. It's, and that's, by the way, the Moses and Elijah connection is mainstream. Like, that's not controversial. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, the whole, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All the mainstream scholars, even fundamentalists will agree that there's, there's mosaic parallels and Elijah parallels and stuff. Uh, so once you admit that they're building Jesus out of Moses and Elijah, the idea that he might, they might be building out of Jesus Ananias, Jesus Ben Ananias, or, uh, right. Uh, and, um, and others becomes much more plausible. So yeah, the composite figure idea is plausible for the gospels. Um, which figures becomes then more a question of exegesis and literary analysis, it's a mimesis analysis and so on. Um, that's a scholarly project as to which figures are being emulated and so on. Um, but when you, but the gospels are late, right? They're like a lifetime later than the origin of the religion. When you go to the origin of the religion, you got to look for other parallels. And I think, they're looking more, they're, they're looking at a Pesher, which is a, a sort of a Bible code way of reading scripture, finding hidden, what they think are hidden messages from God in scripture. Uh, you can find examples of this from the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they will take disparate passages from completely different books and stitch them together. And it's this sort of hidden story that's hidden in the Bible that God put there on purpose. And the and idea is to make it. this current for their current. Exactly. You know, and to come up with, right, exactly. Come up with some or future, but current or future but anyway yeah exactly that uh and so they're looking at mystical models rather than historical models um and so yeah the original jesus i think was invented out of basically that like just this idea of sort of pseudo fictions that they're finding in the in the old testament that aren't really there uh and they're all their jewish angelology that they're borrowing from so this idea of the logos angel and all of that i think they are really building that up from that it's not from actual historical people so it won't be connected to herod or anything like that uh by the time the gospels are written no one really cared about herod like that that was a that was so that was like two lifetimes ago basically it was the the herod story 
I mean, the difference between my kind of hist Jesus histor historicism and your uh, Jesus mysticism is actually almost negligible because yeah, no, my truly. claim is that every everything in the Gospels is basically made up in exactly the way you're saying. Yeah, it's yeah. just that there was some itinerant preacher who said some minimal things and right. probably he was probably from Nazareth and then that got a bit confusing, which is why they had to do the whole, you know, the Bethlehem Nazareth kind of issue. And yeah, I, I know yeah, you, yeah. you talk about that yourself. But, yeah, yeah. But the idea is that, that there's this minimal historical figure, like that there's basically nothing like the Jesus you read in the Gospels. And therefore, what you read in the Gospels and in Paul is entirely constructed. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there are plausible, like I mentioned, there are plausible Jesus models. And for people who are interested in what my most, what I think is the most plausible Jesus model for a historical Jesus uh, is, I keep recommending this. It's still my favorite talk. Uh, I wish there was like a better quality video of it, but you can find it online. It's uh, um, you're all going to die. So, so Google Richard Carrier, you're all going to die. Uh, and it's my Wichita talk uh, where I kind of do this sort of tongue in cheek analysis of it, the, the subtitle tells it all, which is that how the Jews kept failing to predict the end of the world and accidentally caused Christianity. And so that's the subtitle. And I walk at, walk through how that happened. But one of the, the key moment is when I draw in the Josephan Christ. So Josephus talks about a number of figures, like four or five of these guys, who represent themselves as uh, basically as the new Joshua. So they all do something like Joshua did, like they're going to part a river, they're going to topple the walls of a city magically or whatever. They're going to do something that Joshua did. But Joshua, people forget, is Jesus. Those are the same name. The distinction is a modern English convention. But in antiquity... Joshua and Jesus are literally the same name. There's no difference in spelling or anything like that. So Josephus talks about these guys who are these Joshua's. Yeah, <laughs> that's the slideshow. Uh, there's a video that has me doing the talk to the slides. Uh, both are available, so you can check them out. Uh, there you go. Yeah, the, it'll be in there. Oh. It'll be the one right below that. It said Rapture Day uh, on that list that you had just there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I go through this, but there are a number of these guys that, and, and also representing themselves as messiahs, the anointed who would bring about the end of the world. Now, if you say Joshua Messiah, that translates into English as Jesus Christ. So Josephus, actually, he never calls them Jesus. He never says Joshua. He never calls them Christ. He never uses the word Messiah. But his description, like, it's, it's clearly a wink-wink to fellow Jews. He doesn't want to piss off or alarm the Gentiles, so he doesn't use the words. Uh, but but to any Jewish reader, they would immediately not acknowledge, oh, these are Jesus Christ. These are Joshua Messiahs. Uh, and he, so he does multiples of these, like several of these guys. And they all appear to be trying to get themselves killed. They all do things to get themselves killed. And there's you can look in Daniel 9 that looks like there's this idea that there would be a Messiah who would get himself killed. And that would initiate. It would, first of all, end the sins of Israel. It would atone for the sins. And initiate the end of the world. And, and in Daniel 9, there's this whole conversation that Daniel has with the angel Gabriel. It says, like, why, why did not the end of the world come when, when, uh, uh, when the prophets predicted? And the angel says, well, because of the sins of Israel. Like, they're, God is refraining until Israel stops sinning. And then it says, it talks about, well, there will be a Messiah who will die. And then there will be an atonement. Uh, and then the end will come. And so there are other passages you could tie into this, like Isaiah 52, 53, that have this idea of someone dying and atoning for the sins of Israel. And already this idea was developed in the Maccabean literature. You have the Maccabean martyrs that atone for the sins of Israel, right? So there's all this idea is Jewish, super Jewish. But this idea that if someone could die and atone for the sins of Israel, that would end the block on God ending the world. And so God could finally end the world and solve all these problems. And so I think that there are a bunch of these guys, according to Josephus, there are a bunch of these guys running around pretending to be Jesus Christ in their own terms, not in terms of our terms, but in terms of like the, the new Joshua, the new conqueror and the new Messiah and trying to get themselves killed to start the clock to end the world. And I think if that's, if there was a historical Jesus, odds are he's one of these guys, right? Like he's, he's doing this. He thinks he's the new Joshua Christ. He's got to get himself killed and that his death will bring about the final end. Like he, he's really like doing this. I think he's, that's the kind of thing. So I think that's, that's a, that's a plausible historical that's a model. Yeah. 
yeah, and I think that if you're going to talk about historicity, like that's the next most likely thing after my other theory. But um, yeah, it's totally, totally plausible. And then, of course, the rest is just, you know, history from there. Like if you have a bunch of these guys, they're all trying to do it. What are the odds that one of them, their followers are going to come up with something that sticks? Like you're throwing a bunch of shit at the wall. Something's yeah. going to stick, right? Like, so one of these is going to like go on and be successful. And then you look at like happenstance, Paul. If it hadn't been for Paul, Christianity would have just died on the vine, right? Like if it hadn't been for Paul coming up with this innovation where you can convert to Judaism without cutting off a piece of your penis, uh, without giving up bacon, if you, can, if you can convert to this religion that was already fairly popular, there are a lot of Gentiles who, were, who found it a, a, attractive. Paul, Paul is they just, didn't like I mean, this, the, like, the rules. It's like the marketing, the, the uh, Amazon uh, documentary that you feature on, which is marketing the Messiah, which is like Paul is is just repackaging like Judaism to be able to sell it. Like, yeah. no, you, you actually, no, you don't have to cut off the end of your penis because no one's going to yeah. buy that. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm really up for this. I'm really, oh, that's really good. Yeah, I'm up for that. So what do I have he, to do? How do I sign yeah. up? Well, the first thing you do is cut the end of your penis off. No, no, <laughs> no, mate, I'm not doing that. No, I'm you really, you really need to see Paul as the Steve Jobs of Christianity. Yeah. Right. Like he takes this idea of of the, the operating system, the sort of visual operating system that he didn't invent. Uh, it was invented by other people. But he says, oh, look, you can make it easier and package it in a certain way and it's cheaper and whatever. Yes. Yes. And then it becomes massive. Right. And that's what yeah. Paul did. Like it had there not been a Paul, there would not be a Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's that's the thing. Um, since we're, we're in the midst of questions, I wanted to point out. Someone asked the question way back, uh, would I go on Matt Dillahunty's show? Uh, the yes. Uh, and the answer is absolutely, yeah. Uh, I, I, sent him a, I sent him a query a while ago. I've not gotten any response. So uh, if, you, if you want, like, you know, message him and say, hey, have Richard Carrier on. Uh, he may, he may yes, not. So I don't know. But I, I would totally do yeah. it if he would ask me on. Yeah, the yellow stoic. Thank you for that, and and that's your answer. Yeah, uh, did you did you write an article somewhere about or anything about Pilate's alleged letter to Tiberius? Uh, Pilate's sure letter to this. Tiberius. Yes. So I've uh, I was dealing with this recently with someone who's asking about it. There are actually a number of these. There are a ton of forgeries. So there are actually like four or five forged versions. Of Tiberius's letter to uh, Tiberius, I'm sorry, Pilate's letter to Tiberius, uh, and they they exist over a long span of time. So some are medieval, some are late antiquity, uh, some are probably earlier. Uh, the earliest one appears in what we call the Gospel of Nicodemus. It might not have originated there; it might have been incorporated into the Gospel of Nicodemus. Uh, but the first reference we have to it is in Tertullian. Uh, and Tertullian describes the contents of it that matches the version that we have in the Gospel of Nicodemus. Uh, earlier than Tertullian is Justin of Martyr, which is about 160. So Tertullian is about 180 to 200. Uh, Justin Martyr is about 160. And Justin refers to it, but doesn't describe it. So we don't know what he's referring to. He, he might be just referring to a hypothetical uh, acts, what's called an acts, uh, acts of Pilate uh, in Latin, it's acta. Uh, Justin refers to it hypothetically. It's not clear that he's talking about an actual document that he read versus just him just assuming that the, this existed. When we get Tiberius to Tertullian, being a Roman, Roman emperor. Yeah, let's, uh, a Caesar, good, Caesar that's a good point. Let, let's, let's contextualize this. So Pontius Pilate was the prefect of Judea, which was a, a subsection of Syria as a province at the time. So Syria would be governed by a senatorial ranking person. Someone who'd served in the Senate would govern Syria. Uh, and then either they or the emperor would appoint prefects, which are much lower social status ranking people, not in the Senate, basically military officers to govern sections of it. Right. And so like, so Judea would be one section uh, and Pilate was the, the prefect who was assigned to govern that. And so, uh, this is a fairly low-ranking person relative to, you know, the Roman uh, hierarchy. Um, anyway, so so Pilate would be governing that. Now, as a governor of a subsection of Syria, there would be a thing called the, what the there's a thing called acta diurna, which is the daily acts. 
Um, it was, originates in Rome. So there's, there is normally just an Octa Diurna for the Roman Senate. So everything that happened in Rome, administratively, legally, et cetera, would be written on this gazette. It would be kind of like a newspaper, sort of like official, let's say, Russian propaganda paper, uh, essentially, uh, that would come out every day. Uh, and now every province had one, and it's conceivable that every subsection, every uh, district of every province had one. We don't know that's the case, so we don't have any examples, uh, but it's possible that there were Acta Diurna of Pontius Pilate. There might have been. Um, if that were the case, Justin Martyr is just assuming that was the case, and so he just says, oh, check the Acta Diurna. It will surely confirm uh, what the Gospels say. Uh, and I think that's a case where he's just assuming, because um, he, he's so gullible, he thinks that that's actually the case. Um but when we get to Tertullian, he's actually describing the contents of this, and the contents are absurd. They're, they're, there's no possible way they come from an actual uh, Roman state gazette. Uh, they come from this bogus forgery uh, that we find later in the Gospel of Nicodemus. Uh, and so um, have I written about this? I have not. Um, I think if you go to, there's a Wikipedia article on Pilate's letters, plural, to Tiberius because there's so many forgeries. Uh, and it has a section on each one. The Wikipedia article is not bad. Uh, it's worth worth checking. I can't vouch for everything the Wikipedia article says, but it's a good place to start. Um, there is Christian writings online. If you Google Christian writings and pilot Tiberius, you might find it. Um, yeah, I mean, there are all sorts. Of, it's just a sort of letter written by... Yes, yeah, so, of course, some of this is going to be fundamentalist bullshit. Yeah, uh, so you yeah. want to find you want to discern and find like the you know the honest scholarly treatments of it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, no, I have not written on this um, because it's so bogus. It's off my radar generally. Uh, and and I guess a final question before we uh, get to sort of moving towards wrapping things up: mm -hmm. Does a didash uh, imply historicity of Jesus? Do you want to explain what the didash is? Uh, the Didache. Uh, so, do, yeah. do you know what all my life i've been pronouncing that by dash and uh, as, as well as i'm sure so many to people be, and to then, be fair i don't know if there is a colloquial english uh pronunciation so yeah. so like there's um people will say cephas that is the traditional english translation of kephos uh yeah. which is peter so kephos is the actual pronunciation cephas is a modern english version so I don't know what, I actually don't know what the colloquial English pronunciation of Didache is, but Def Greek, definitely Didache, definitely Didache. Yeah. <laughs> the Greek is Didache. Uh, so um, that's the, in the original uh, language, but. Every um, day's a school day, viewers. Every day's a school day. Yeah. Uh, I would say no, but I did not extensively uh, analyze it because it's undateable. Uh, so because the Didache can't be dated early, its data is useless, uh, basically, for the purposes of determining historicity. Uh, it would be relevant if you want to analyze what community produced the Didache, like if you want to study the history of the Didache itself, um, then it becomes relevant. But in terms of like the raw question of did Jesus exist, it's not usable. Uh, and so I didn't, I basically just put it off my radar. I did look over it. Uh, I didn't find anything obviously historicist in it, but that doesn't mean that someone can't make an argument uh, and if they did, it would be just be an argument for what the authors of the Didache believed. Uh, it would these be are these are church fathers writing sort of teaching. Whoever, yeah, oh, definitely Christians, but we don't know who mm. uh, wrote the, the author is not identified. They don't they don't identify their community. They don't identify where they are. They don't identify who they are. Um, they don't identify when they wrote it. Uh, so uh, it's it's what I categorize as useless evidence. I think there's one reference to it in my book on the history of the city of Jesus, where I, I make this point, where it's like, we can't date it. We don't know where it comes from. So it's not usable uh, as evidence. So I just sort of shunt it aside, but I haven't done a thorough study of it uh, to analyze this question. It, like, are the authors of the Didache believers in history of or not? I can't answer that question. Um, and that, so uh, just find I mean, the final point I want to make is, and I know you're not a huge, or you haven't seen eye to eye, too much with Bart Ehrman over over time. Although 
it's interestingly he and you've noticed this as well obviously but he <laughs> he's changing his tunes on a lot of things like <laughs> the empty tomb the two body hypothesis of poor you know uh, over time i've seen him go like give yeah. up certain things not not to say to go towards mythicism but like a lot of the things you've been saying over time he's like now agreeing that that's kind of plausible um, but one of his one of his books is Jesus Before the Gospels is is actually it's really good book and talking about how you get from Jesus to the Gospels. This is a really interesting thing, and it's so yeah. much of what we've talked about is is that we we assume like Christians do, like even skeptics, because you're brought up in the culture of the Bible, that this whole thing is just one coherent narrative, right? That it was written as one book. And it's so obviously not. And these are books that have been born out of the communities they're written in. And we don't really know what these guys were thinking at the time, what stories are flying around. We have some of the non-canonical texts that have bonkers things, but that's not to say that <laughs> these aren't bonkers. It's like we've drawn <laughs> yeah. this arbitrary line. And because you've grown up in the yeah. context of these stories, being told we don't see right. them as bonkers but we see the ones that that, that these non-canonical texts are, yeah are, yeah yeah are, they aren't that yeah. much stranger yeah that's true they just yeah. have different it, strange things yeah exactly and, and it's just it, and it's the idea that that these people you know that are writing these gospels won't necessarily have known the, the other gospels or the, ver the same version of God, that gospel that we might think you know that we have access to now and so yeah. it's all so much more of an unknown and, and a big mess and people are audience when you're writing it's audience purpose task so your task or your form is defined by who your audience is and what your purpose is and then yeah. once you understand that you you understand that everyone's writing with an with with an agenda to fulfill their objective and they're writing a certain way that will su succeed in that objective and and yeah. all of these are disparate pieces of writing that, that then are just cobbled together to, to and I know this is basics but this kind of I suppose leads us on to talking about your course but it's yeah just, I, I, no that's really a good point um yeah I was just thinking like oh my god there's so many things that people need to understand about this uh yeah and that's what I do in my uh myth vision course uh which there's a link to I think under the video um, yes there is which you can go to uh and, and uh, Jono gets a commission if you sign up so uh, definitely do. It's um, it's an eight lecture, so it's eight videos. Uh, there is recommended readings. So there's, a, there's a syllabus for each lecture. The recommended readings are read as much as you want. Uh, the only required course text that I think that you should definitely get and read is Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, which is, uh, we referenced this earlier, uh, but it's my book uh, that has a lot of my historical papers in it, a lot of peer-reviewed articles and magazine articles and other things, but um, the whole book sort of represents what you do when you do biblical studies. It's, it's a whole range of things that you do when you do that. And there's a example of every possible thing in there. That's the only required text for the course, but uh, you listen to or watch, ideally watch, because there's a lot of visuals in this particular course, there's a lot of visuals, uh, watch it and think about it, do as much of the uh, syllabus readings as you can, um, certainly the, the linkable ones there, there's links in there to like public articles that are easy to read and the Hitler Homer Bible Christ readings and do all of that. But what I point out is the kind of questions you're asking is like, what even is the new Testament? Uh, how did it come about to give you an example? It's actually the second new Testament. We don't have the original one, which is something that people don't realize. Uh, our new Testament is the rebuttal new Testament to the original new Testament. Uh, and so like, if you can't understand, you can't understand what we have without understanding that because our new Testament was entirely assembled as an answer, a rebuttal or an attack on the original new Testament, which we don't have. Uh, and so, uh, and so that, that, that's just an example of there's multiple things that I go through in the course. Uh, I also talk about in the course, I go through the skills of how you can get out the original Greek, a lot of interesting things in there. Uh, about if we talk about Easter, like what does the word resurrection even mean in ancient Greek? Like what words were actually used uh, in the New Testament? There are actually a few uh, and they are not straightforward. So uh, it's, so if you want to like dive into questions like that, uh, I give you the skills. There's a lot of public tools that you can use as a layperson to get at the underlying Greek of the New Testament. Also the underlying Hebrew, if you want to go to the Old Testament, uh, all of that's in there. Uh, so anyway, this course goes into like how to teach you the skills, how to teach you the basic framework of what 
everybody in my field just takes for granted. Uh, like we all know that our New Testament is not the original New Testament, but most people don't know that. Uh, most people don't know why that's the case and how that affects everything we do uh, with the New Testament. So all of that stuff, there's a ton more uh, that I cover in the course uh, and the readings, the syllabus alone is a handy reading. If you really want to deep dive this stuff, it, it zeroes in on what you want to actually read to get at uh, and do this. And my lectures give you the framework to start with uh, and so how you can get on that. And the goal is to teach just an average person how to do this kind of stuff, how to do New Testament studies, how to tackle, how to tackle the New Testament in the original Greek and things like that, how to read the scholarship discernibly, uh, critically, and so on. Uh, I want to give people those skills so they can do it because uh, you shouldn't have to rely on us uh, and the expert, the so-called experts, uh, to tell you things. You should be able to like be able to question and vet what we say. Uh, and if you want those basic skills, that's what is my that's what my New Testament studies course does. Uh, and it's set up now, and I, I think uh, the video course uh, works really well. Uh, I've reviewed it all. It looks great. Uh, and uh, it's lifetime subscription. So once you're in, you can go back to the videos as long as you want uh, and, and so on and, and revisit them and everything. Uh, so, yeah, and it's super cheap. That's the other thing. Uh, it's not going to yeah, cost you thousands. It's really reasonable. Yeah, 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 it's not thousands of dollars. So, um no, I find this super valuable. I really want, really do want like more people in the world, as many people as possible to do at least that, right? Like to like go through that, do that course, get that basic understanding so that when you're interacting with Christians, you know this stuff. Uh, and you also know how to question everything, even the shit that I say. Uh, I want to give you the skills to question and test even my own lectures, right? <laughs> Uh, that's the goal. Uh, and I want everybody to be like that. And so uh, the fact that Myth Vision is offering this course so affordably and that it can just be reproduced and, and, and do that, uh, I find valuable for the world. And so I'm, I'm glad that that's happening. Uh, yes, also I benefit, I get uh, some income from it and I do depend on that because as an independent scholar. Yeah. Uh, so I do encourage people to spread the news uh, just if you want to support my work and and keep me going. Uh, it does that as well, and it also helps the channel. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, as as you said, I mean, all of the above. Uh, it, yeah, it, do you find that in in the world of New Testament academia, that the and this kind of goes back to the seventy five percent of New Testament scholars idea. <laughs> do, do, do you find you know, we'll come full circle? Do, do you find that the the in this internet age where we, uh, there are so many people now that are armchair. Uh, scholars at home learning this stuff that, that but also those people are then feeding through into universities and education that actually there's a, if you do a cross section of people studying new testament or, or bible studies or religion so on and so forth that that you are seeing a much greater representation of skeptics and agnostics and atheists in in those positions yeah, no, recently, especially, uh, I think like if you look at the current generation, like the scholars that are just now being minted or are in the process, like in their doctoral studies now, uh, I think a large number of them are in YouTube influenced. Uh, yeah. so they're not ignorant of this stuff. And so they know the kinds of arguments that are going on. Uh, and then of course they're being given the skills to vet those arguments. Uh, so I think we're seeing definitely an effect uh, and a different attitude is coming through forward. Uh, like the, it's, it's less elitist, right? There's, there's this idea of the, the, the elite, like we have special schools, we have special backgrounds. Um, you can't question this kind of idea. And we live in our own little universe and, uh, you know, it's, it's, we have our own vocabularies and our own assumptions and so on. Uh, that old school way of thinking, I think, is dying out. I think we've got the new school coming in. Uh, so if we look at the future generations, I think we're going to see much more uh, diverse and uh, critical thinking going on in biblical studies. I really do see that happening. I, so what I predict is in 10 years time, when you when you debate William Lane Craig and he's in a Zimmer frame and he gets up <laughs> onto the page and, and you're like, right, right, a bill. Uh, so. 25% of New Testament scholars now believe in the empty tomb, the historicity of the empty tomb. <laughs> oh, how the worm has turned, Bill. How the worm has turned. Yeah. Um, no, it's interesting that, that Habermas has already admitted that that's no longer a minimal fact. 
So yeah. well, uh, apologetics so it, have to be based without the empty tomb now. That's that's. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure William Lane Craig he doesn't seem to do like he, he used to was so formulaic in his debates and these yeah, four yeah. things and he would say and he, he used to the the um, uh, old um, Joseph of Arimathea and he'd throw in that one and then he stopped doing that because it's as if. Like, I don't know. Did you notice he stopped doing no, that? No, I totally don't... have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've noticed this. Um, like, Craig is really, like, he developed the Empty Tomb apologetic beyond anyone. Like, he was the par yeah. excellence of this. Uh, no, even even he is succumbing to the trend of shrinking shrinking facts. <laughs> yeah, because you have a massive defend... minimal facts. Of, yeah, you're right. I've gone from, like, right. 12 or whatever it was down to, like, 6 now or yeah, something. Now it's 3. Uh, or is three. it really? It's three really? or two, depending on, uh, yeah, the, Michael Lacona's book is the one where Habermas comes out admitting like, uh, two, three. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> Some, more than one. There's more than one. Like, yeah. There's an S on it. There's an S I did a talk. People, people can get the video uh, when I did, just recently, there was a conference on, athe an e-conference on atheism at the Global Center for the Study of Religion. So G GCR, uh, GCSR, oh, I'm forgetting it. Global Center for the Study of Religion, TSCSR. Am I doing that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I did a talk on this on the diminishing facts uh, apologetic, which uh, where I talk about this, and, and also in there, I, I that's where I bring out the, what my revelation, which is I think the key that you find in all apologetics, and I think this has been true since the '70s, but I only really noticed it like in the last ten years, which is this need to conflate Paul with the Gospels. And, and once you can separate those two and keep them apart, you can debunk all resurrection apologetics. Uh, and, and I think that's really the crucial thing. It's the carrier wedge approach, isn't it? Yeah. Like the dis discovery. Good point. Yeah. Move over. <laughs> People might not know wedge the wedge, the wedge joke. Uh, yeah. So there's the white paper of, uh, was it, it wasn't the creation Institute. It was the discovery. Institute, um, wasn't it? The discovery Institute had the wedge yeah. document about okay i think it's been so long since i've done this is a good example of your first question we've gone full circle how do i remember <laughs> yeah uh so it yeah is, kind of opening so the door ago. to the acceptability yeah. of intelligent design and then once you start saying oh we can have yeah we can have books in here or whatever yes. it is it's it like, was about how now creationism yeah defeating it was the wedge document it was a secret circulated white document white paper from long ago about how they admitted that they needed evolution to be kicked out of schools to get the Bible back in. Uh, and so it was, it was like that we're going to, we're not going to say Bible. We're not going to talk about the Bible. We're just going to attack evolution. And here's some talking points, but the end goal is to get the Bible back into schools uh, and to get students being taught the Bible. And so uh, that was the wedge document, the idea of using the creationism evolution debate as a yeah. wedge to get biblical literalism back into high school, basically elementary schools and high schools in, in yeah. U S United States terms. Secular. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a big deal when it came out and it was huge. That was like 20 years ago, I think. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, so yeah, the way it's my wedge argument is once yeah, you but, can but, get the wedge yeah. between Paul and the gospels, it's all over for Christianity. Yeah, I, but, but, but that is the case though. You, yeah. You know, it really no, is. It's, and, it's factual. And, yeah. You know, the fact that Paul doesn't mention any details about Jesus's life at all, when he has perfect opportunity and cause to do so is really telling. Like, uh, yeah. you know, he, he's trying to convince people. He's trying to convince people of stuff, right? Well, well, if you're trying to convince them of stuff about Jesus, now's your time to, to say some facts about Jesus, <laughs> some pretty persuasive yeah. facts that you could bring to bear. But he doesn't say any because he, he doesn't know them. They aren't, because they, they haven't been created yet. You've got yeah. to wait till Mark comes along or the community of Mark comes along, the community of Matthew and Luke, so on and so forth. Sorry, yeah. I, I will for for the audience. I will poo poo the word community uh, because I do agree with Robin Faith Walsh's book on this, where she annihilates the idea of communities uh, making these decisions. Um, for people who are interested in that, check out my blog. I do a review of Robin Faith Walsh's book uh, on this. I disagree with her on some things. I agree with her on other things, but the book ultimately is quite brilliant. Uh, and I think is the future of biblical scholarship. She's not alone. There's others who've gone in the same direction, but she's just to qualify. Best. When I was saying a community, I mean the 
that person the sectarian is perspective a, yeah yeah is within a community and that is what forms their ideas it's which like is which just, i do agree with yeah i do yeah, think like yeah. mark is coming from a perspective and i think that perspective is shared by people like he has people behind yeah. him uh yeah. but it's not the people deciding what he writes he's writing his but own yes, thing 100%, uh, yes, and, and that's yes. people think like it's a trivial distinction it, it's less trivial than you think uh when you look at the broad scope of biblical scholarship and this gets to my course issue is like how you, in one of the things I teach in the course is how do you approach biblical scholarship, the peer reviewed scholarship in this. Uh, and Robin Faith Walsh's book is a good example. Like it's a good study of how that can go wrong. And therefore, if you know how it can go wrong, you know how to be critical of it. So you can see how, how can scholars screw things up? Uh, and she gives a good example of how that's happened in biblical studies, gospel studies, especially. Uh, once you see the, a model of that, then you, now you can sort of generalize that to all the other ways it could have gone wrong. And so you know what questions to ask, like what things to be questionable about, right? Like which things to be uh, doubtful of and so on. So uh, yeah, her book is really excellent for that. And um, that, that's kind of the point of my course is to give you those basic yeah. skills for how do you approach this sort of thing. Brilliant stuff. Well, I just, I knew it's GCRR. I almost said, I'm pretty sure it's GCRR. There we go. Yeah. Global Center for Religious Research. Yeah. That's, that's what it. it is. And <laughs> they, they are also a pub publisher as well who, who publish books as well. Yeah, um, yeah. They've, uh, they've got lots of good conferences. I recommend them. Uh, and they're even sponsoring some scientific research. So they did a, oh. a religious trauma study recently where they studied, they did a really big survey of the scale and frequency of religious trauma. Basically, people who suffer psychological trauma from their religious upbringing uh, or exposure to religion. And so they did an actual proper study of this. And they're doing other things, but that's, that's an example. Uh, I think it's a good institute to keep an eye on. Uh, and they do these e-conferences. I try to attend as many of them as I can. So uh, if people want to see more of me, keep your eye on the GCRR conferences. Uh, they're e-conferences so they can be attended from around the world. Good stuff. Excellent. Well, look, look, I, uh, Richard, uh, I know that we've gone on longer uh, than you, totally than you fine. said. Yeah, but if, if that's cool. I, I really Good. appreciate this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, love it. And and you know, it, whenever you want to come on and and pimp anything that you're doing out to the, to the wider public, you know, just shoot me a message and and you know, mm -hmm. I'm happy to oblige. I really do appreciate this. Um, would you? What would be your I guess, closing words about the resurrection, about Easter, about, uh, or, or you said that you might know a really bizarre argument. What's a really bizarre? Oh God, argument? that would be a long story. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of where, where do I talk about this that I could direct people to? I can't think of it right now, but um, my favorite stupid argument for the resurrection is uh, Charles Worth. People complain about me complaining about Charles Worth on this, but it is a bonkers argument. And I just have to be honest, right? Here's the argument. Okay, got to make sure I get this right. Um, so uh, there are multiple scholars, including myself, who think that uh, the gospel, the original gospel of John, it's important to note that our gospel of John is multiply redacted. It's been rewritten by other authors over time. So we don't have the original gospel of John. But in, in what looks like, one of the layers of the Gospel of John, uh, it was originally promoted as the Gospel of Lazarus, and the beloved disciple is Lazarus. And you, you there's an, I point this out in On the Historicity of Jesus. I give examples where originally this beloved disciple, who is the eyewitness that they cite as their source, supposedly wrote some original document that they rely on, is Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is a fictional character, so it's a fictional source. Now, this there's... Like I said, there, this is a tradition in the field. There are multiple scholars who've argued this. Now, Charles Worth is a fundamentalist or at least evangelical Christian. He can't have this. He can't have it be a fictional Lazarus wrote the Gospel of John or wrote the source that, uh, that the Gospel of John is based on. So he has to argue against this. And this is an argument for the authenticity of the resurrection account in John. It's not just made up because, here's his argument, um, if it was Lazarus, uh, who, and this would mean that Lazarus is the one who ran, according to the Gospel of John, who ran to the tomb and beat Peter to the tomb and found the claw, the burial claws, the, the bandages laying there empty, and then realized that Jesus had risen from the dead, just as Lazarus had done. Uh, 
uh, it can't be that. It can't be Lazarus because someone who had been recently resurrected can't run fast. I mean, <laughs> it might be true. I mean, it could, it could be true. I mean, it's, it's plausible. Yeah, it's I quite... guess it's plausible. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, and this isn't a serious peer reviewed monograph. I, I was just like, is this for real? This is his argument. It can't, it can't have actually been Lazarus. Because... This is what happens when you are starting <laughs> with a conclusion that you are so desperate to is post hoc rationalization, yeah. like uh, right. plenty there. It's just like, and, and right, it, this right. must be true. So, how do we get this to be true? And it's an example of dropping the facade where he's letting his fundamentalism show because in fiction, anybody can do anything, right? Like you can't say that a fictional character can't run fast because it's fiction. It can run as fast as the author wants the fiction to do. Uh, so he's basically operating from the mindset of literalism that Lazarus was literally resurrected. There is some sort of literal physics or biology that relates to resurrected people that makes them unable to run fast. Uh, and, and so this, this kind of like weird, bizarre uh, literalism about this is that's the weirdest argument I've ever heard kind of like nice. pushing for uh, the resurrection being authentic. Well, uh, the, uh, Aaron, right. Aaron, a good old Aaron here says, so Thank have you, we Aaron. confirmed that Jesus was raised by technology from uh, Klaatu? Uh, just to let you know, Dr. Aaron Adair and myself have just co-authored a book that will be out imminently. Literally, it's, it's, it's penned for May the 4th release. It's called Aliens and Religion, Where Two Worlds Collide, where we look at the impact of discovering intelligent alien life uh, out there and what that would have effect that, that would have on religion, on theology, uh, both psychologically and theologically uh so and i have to say i literally this morning was looking over that uh draft of that and it is good uh and, and i was thinking like like this kind Thank of you. book like does this need even need to be written and and as i was reading it i was like it really did right like it's a fringe subject sure but this is and, and I, this is my blurb. And I was I was thinking, like, I got to give you guys a blurb. And I was thinking, what would my blurb be? And it was going to be and the thing that I was bouncing around immediately was I love definitive treatments of subjects. And this is a definitive treatment of that subject. Like, like it's it's one of those things. My dissertation advisor, William Harris at Columbia University, like taught me, like, if you're going to write a book make it a book that people have to consult forever. Like it has to be like the, so defi even if it gets overruled or whatever, it still has to be, it has to be read. Like you can't do the study of that subject without reading the book, do that. And I'm like, and he wrote a lot of books that fit that category. So I had a model and that's what you've done. So in this subject, there's Amazing. no, thanks Richard. Yeah, no, it's true. Like that, that book, it ha if, if this is a subject you want to know something about or hear something about, you have to read this book and it's it's not like casual throwaway joke apologetics it is like good analysis essential analysis and a lot of the we actually do some science in there as well and math uh good math yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah for sure but, uh, here's, here's an anecdote richard <laughs> so so the the leading astro theologian in the world like ted peters so he's a guy that writes on like yeah uh, you know what what the what what the the kind of theological um, ideas and theories as to if aliens exist, whether you would have to have billions of Jesus or one Jesus, that's <laughs> one, rule, yeah. one ring to rule them all type thing. And uh, and he, we sent him a manuscript, and I think he thought we were Christians. And then he was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll read through it." And 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 he went, he <laughs> he, he sent an email back, and he, he, I think he had gone through to, to Aaron, and he, I think he'd gone through like the book as he's going, and then he got to the point where it's like, "Oh God, these guys are atheists," and they are like <laughs> like the bit where we're like where we're like, "Yeah." So only God is a real problem. And this is like where we're going to like the philosophy of theology that, that doesn't work. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> it's but, like, oh. oh, that's a shame. To be fair, you have a chapter on how this could impact atheism. And the ch and it was funny, like when I was reading, it was like, well, I had in my mind, like, well, what if? And then I get to that section. I'm like, fuck, they thought of everything. I thought. Of. <laughs> like how this, how this could turn on atheists, like a good, the opposite like it flipped the script, like it could. 
yeah. it's unlikely. Like you point out why it's unlikely, but nonetheless, you have it in there. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. Uh, now I didn't, so I didn't comprehensively read the whole thing. So I don't yeah. know, don't know if the book includes a reference. So what, <laughs> there's a thing, God, how long ago was this? This was, I want to think maybe the early nineties. I know there was a role-playing game. Oh, no, I thought you were going to say this because you nope. mentioned this pamphlet. Oh, no, absolutely. Is... No, I've totally looked for that and you totally do cite it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm aware of that. I've been talking about that for years, but uh, that's no, exactly. That's an ex other example of how you fucking cover everything. Uh, it's all in there. Um, no, there's a role playing game. And I remember, so I had this Christian friend way back in high school and we were totally into role playing games. I still am. But he said, oh, there's this Christian role playing game that is kind of like a fantasy game that's based on multiple planets. And the theme is that there's a, 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 a basically a crucified and resurrected Jesus on every world. And in this, and so this is like early nineties in this role. I can't remember the title of it, but there is a role playing game that, that posited this. And so you talk about this as a possibility and like how that would work. And they're like, Oh my God. <laughs> that's it, I mean, amazing. this is it. But like, if you've got intelligent life, uh, like, like I know I, this, we should be ending now. But if you've got intelligent <laughs> life, if you've got intelligent life, then you've got moral life, and you know we did talk about this. And if you've got moral yeah. life, you've got you've got sin. Unless, and the problem is, if you have moral life but not sin, then why are we the ones? That, it's unfair on us. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Problem. Why has God make yeah. us the broken ones? Okay, so let's assume that they're they're all broken. In which case, you've got well, that's a problem of design. For a start like if you can't yeah, yeah. you're like uh, adam and then, eve can't fucked up other planets like <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so you so, so you go down it's like almost this branching sort of database and you get to okay well that in that case if everyone if everyone's broken everyone needs saving so how does the jesus here save everyone but how would they know imagine you got to see a story somehow because you couldn't experience it it wasn't happening here so you you're on the planet earth but jesus actually existed on schliblu Right. And then, yeah. but you get it beamed into your head or you get to see it on a TV screen <laughs> with some kind of tentacled alien, which, and then how can you empathize with that and feel like we feel when you watch um, The Passion of Christ and you go, you know, he's getting, you know, flogged, you like, you feel that and you feel the pain and it's that empathy. Well, if it's some like tentacled alien, it's like, I don't feel that. And so, therefore, that's unfair. So, so therefore, okay, there has to be a billion Jesus or a trillion yeah, yeah. Jesus. There's the only, and yeah. Right. And that's just one of like 15 points that one needs to cover. Yeah. Your book does cover them all. So yeah, I, I recommend to everybody to check this out. Uh, it, 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 yeah, Thanks, like man. I said, it's appreciate such a definitive book on this. Nice one. Oh, I really appreciate it. Well, look, uh, I've really enjoyed tonight. Um, everyone go and sign up to Richard's course. It is really reasonable. I mean, it really is. I was quite surprised. And it sounds like absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, You've got unlimited and time to take it and to review it and all of that. So that's the benefit of it. And all of uh, Richard's books are brilliant. I haven't read your your uh, your Hitler um, Homer mm. book. Hitler but... Homer Bible Christ. Uh, it's yeah. a play on Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, uh, and it's because it covers it, every subject in the title is covered in the book. Uh, but it, it's really you are John Le, John Le Carre. Yeah, <laughs> you know the 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 origin of this book is this is a thing people don't realize that independent scholars don't get paid. Uh, for peer-reviewed work. Uh, the journals make tons of money off of your work, but they, they pay you nothing, zero. You get no, no royalty on any of that. Uh, if you do academic monographs, you'll get a percentage, but it's crap, and they always overprice the book so they don't sell. Basically, academic, uh, academic publication is kind of screwed in terms of capitalism. But anyway, yeah. um, what they do do, when you, do, when you publish a peer-reviewed article... Most journals, so far, I think all journals, I don't know if there's an exception, but uh, the, you, the contract you sign usually says that you have the right to republish your article in an anthology of your own works. And I am a publisher, so I can publish an anthology of my own works. So uh, if you want to see like all of my peer-reviewed history articles, in future, I'm going to do one of my peer-reviewed philosophy articles. I don't, I haven't done that yet, but uh, all my history stuff up to 2014, at least, uh, is in Hitler, Homer, Bible Christ, including my magazine articles and all of that other stuff. Uh, I can sell it for like 20 bucks. They will sell each article for like 35. And that's just for a PDF. 
so you know they're 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 making bank and i get nothing off of that so if you want to like support the actual author of the study <laughs> that's what yeah. hitler homer does and so you can get all of the articles for you know a discount price basically yeah yeah uh, well uh, you've sold me so uh yeah <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, um, look, massive, massive appreciation, mate. Uh, uh, where where can people find you? What your final words? Uh, RichardCarrier.info. So just my name is one word, dot .info. That's my website. has everything. My Twitter link, my Facebook link, uh, my books, my classes, um, my blog, uh, and my Patreon, if you want to help support. Because I am an independent scholar, so I actually live and make a living off of people who support my work as patrons in the classic Renaissance sense. Uh, and so uh, if you want to help support me, there's various ways to support my work, not just that, but others. You can look at the how to help link on my website. But go to richardcarrier.info and everything Richard Carrier is there. So you can you can start there and, and figure it all out. Awesome. Excellent. I advise everyone to do that. And of course, you all knew that anyway. I mean, I'd be very surprised if everyone's on here. So, like, oh, right. RichardCarrier.info. Right. I'll, I'll check that out. Um, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I'm there every day, mate. Um, but, uh, but no, uh, thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, and thanks for thank having you to me everyone on. else. Uh, happy Easter to everyone, whatever that means to you. Uh, it doesn't mean a lot to me. Uh, but uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hey-ho. Uh, toodle pips, everyone. And thanks again, Richard. Bye, all.